I want to thank you all for joining us on this Thursday evening for this session, which will be one of probably three sessions with Sharon. Uh, this evening's session will probably last around an hour and a half. Uh, and the following two sessions, uh, which the next one is scheduled for the 19th, will be of approximate uh, similar length in time, and we'll continue on the conversation and topics that we discussed this evening. Sharon Loudon is an artist, educator, advocate for artists, editor of the Living and Sustaining a Creative Life series of books, and the artistic director of the Chautauqua Visual Arts at Chautauqua Institution. She graduated with a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from Yale University School of Art. Her work has been exhibited in numerous venues, including the Aldrich Con Contemporary Art Museum, the Drawing Center, Carnegie Mellon University, Wiseman Art Museum, National Gallery of Art, Birmingham Museum of Art, Weatherspoon Art Museum, and the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Sharon has taught since 1991. Her teaching experience includes studio and professional practice classes to students of all levels in many institutions throughout the United States. Colleges and universities at which she has lectured and taught include Kansas City Art Institute, College of St. Rose, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Vanderbilt University, New York Academy of Art, and Maryland Institute of uh, College of Art. Uh, Sharon, I want to thank you for joining us this evening and sharing your knowledge with artists, not only in our community, but even further out, because I know we do have artists as far away as California with us this evening. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us and, and sharing your knowledge. And I'm going to hand it over to you now so that you can begin. Thank you so much. And thanks for that great introduction. And thank you, Patrick, um, for even thinking of me. I first want to uh, ask everyone, since we have a, a fairly reasonable group, because usually group, the groups I, I um, share webinars for are much larger and they're less personal, which is something that is unfortunate. I always love to have a more of a personal engagement. But I just want to ask everyone, you know, why you're here today and if you're an artist or, or creative, a creative mind and what's your interest um, in, in, uh, in, in taking some time with us today? Because uh, we're only gonna be here for, let's say an hour, an hour and a half. And, um, and I just wanna to be able to use that time efficiently. Um, so would anybody like to jump in and share and just say hello who, who you are and uh, where you're from and, and what your interest is? Well, I'll go. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> um, my name is Danielle Baver, and I live in San Clemente, California. I'm from New York originally, so oh. um, I uh, do ceramic abstract wall art, so they're ge geometric, and uh, I have a background in graphic design and architecture, and so I'm sort of going by the seat of my pants. I'm really just following, somehow I've gotten to where I am. So um, I've sold at some galleries uh, and some private um, customers, clients. And I'm trying to figure out, I'd like to transition from my day job to full-time artist. And um, I feel a little bit isolated doing, not having like a BFA, MFA background connections and all that. So I'm just following and seeing and somehow you appeared. And so I thought, why not? So that's kind of where I'm at. Well, thank you. Um, I, I love I love talking to any artist. Oh, thank you. I love talking to artists um, of any kind of education you know, education doesn't come in the form necessarily in my mind of a degree. Um, there's also life education, life le learning. Um, and as Patrick was so kind of mentioned, my involvement with Chautauqua Institution, I'm here right near Erie, about 45 minutes away uh, at the Chautauqua Visual Arts. And we established this program here, which is a residency program, uh, inter intergenerational, open to any age over 21. Um, and we have ages uh, 22 to 62, because everybody always needs a mentor. And, and in your case, which is so interesting, is that also um, people think 
I think sometimes people think that just because someone has like a day job doesn't mean it, it to me it doesn't mean that you're any less of an artist and as far as full-time artist um you know i think that's a really hard leap and I, I actually think that the myth of uh and it's pretty factual that not many artists have that route they have usually some form of income in in other capacities so we, we can get into that and i really appreciate you um sharing and welcome it's nice to meet you thank you S steven do you want to go next since you're right next to me in the box oh i can't hear you there we go sorry i was muted not at all nice to meet yeah. you nice where to meet are you located right now thank you uh, i'm in san francisco oh cool and, and i am a poet oh and um, I don't know if it's nationwide, but Everbright, Eventbrite, the organization that promotes various community events and um, yours was listed and it sounded very okay. intriguing. And so was, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I guess my main goal is um, finding, I do have a couple of, one main source of community around my, my writing poetry, which is great. And I'm just seeing if there's possibly other sources of community that I could tap into. And uh, what, are, what are good strategies of doing that? Or even starting my own, you know, you know, right. if you can't find what you're looking for, you got to create it yourself. Um, so those, those issues and other things. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, just off the top of my head, what's really closely related to poetry is visual arts. And yeah. often, oftentimes the visual arts collaborate so much with poetry and that's extremely popular. And I think um, it meaning extremely over, over many years, uh, that has been a, a wonderful um, partnership or, or if you will, like a sisterhood or brotherhood where, where there's, it's a, it's an abstract, both are abstract forms in one way or the other. Um, I always think about like Phil Gustin, he had a few collaborations with his work and, and poets um, and writers. So I would be happy to take that dive with you. And this is most relevant to every media, especially the medias such as um, poetry and the visual arts. So thank you. It's nice to meet you. I was nice. just in San Francisco, amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, Cappy, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, it's Cappy. Can you hear me? Yes, nice to meet you. Where are you coming from? I'm actually here in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and I am tuning in because Patrick shared uh, this webinar with me. Um, I teach, I've been teaching for over 20 years at Edinburgh University. I teach metals and jewelry, and I've also started teaching professional practices, and I use your books oh. in my, um, yeah, it, the artist is culture producer. I have my students read some of the essays, and I think it's such a wonderful way for them to see that, that sustaining a creative life is a holistic kind of practice. I love how people talk about their path, and um, so anyway, I just really appreciate your essays and your essay and your introduction and how you frame everything. So I just thought this was a great opportunity to, to be here with you. I do want to apologize because I have to leave early. One of my students is giving a talk at seven, so I can only be here for the first hour, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Wonderful. Well, that's really kind. And I'm hoping to get another book in your hands. I'm dying to complete at my third book, and I'm hoping I can get that out to you. We, we actually share all the royalties uh with all of our art all of the contributors so it's a community built engagement and here at chautauqua some of those uh essayists are here in session so if you ever want to stop by and say hello it'd be great i love that it's really a great way to get conversation happening with the students it's it really engages them very much well thank you they they're actually living and breathing and and it's their words so it's great mac hi Hi, it's very nice to meet you. I'm Mac. Um, I'm living in New York City right now, but I'm oh, sort of wow. nomadic. I'm here because um, Patrick, I'm going to out him, was very excited to have you here and was like, oh. yo, I'm super excited out. 
Um, I'm a writer and it's sort of manifested in podcasting and playwriting. Um, but this thing um, that the first person had sort of mentioned in terms of uh, creating a life and identifying as an artist sort of as your like main thing, as your main stick, really, really resonated with me. But also reading the words, uh, sustaining a creative life, like hopefully my life is long. Uh, we should be so lucky. And, um, and just as I'm starting to come into this identity, something that you so obviously embrace, I'm wondering how to do that long term. It feels really exciting and hot when things happen, uh, kind of in these spurts or these gigs. Um, and I'm trying to kind of see what it's like to look at it like, you know, like the long game and uh, soak all that in both from the definitely sustaining like the creative motor, but more, um, yeah, like how to, how to <laughs> uh, balance it with other ways of making, making money, making connections um, and not losing that sort of fire. I'm also very interested in once you start getting paid well, um, you know, when you're so used to sort of making stuff because of your lack of finances or that ha happens to be one of your limitations, how do you dream when you start getting paid for those things? Um, I'm here to soak up all the things that you uh, have to offer. I'm very excited to be here. Well, thank you. Where are you coming from in New York City? Because it looks like you're in a cabin. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, it's just a, it's a backdrop. No, I'm playing. Um, I it is. Um, I'm in Westchester right now. Um, I'm house sitting for another couple days, and then I'll actually be in Pittsburgh for three weeks. So wonderful. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Um, Pamela, are you there? I am. I am. Hi, Pamela. Where are you coming I'm from? Hi. I'm, hi there. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. And um, I'm here. I teach at BC and I've been here for many years. Um, and I've worked, um, I teach animation. I'm an animator, an artist, which sounds like a job, and it is. Um, so I'm here to really look at how to to work independently from an institution because yeah. academic institutions don't really support creative work and yeah. um, research, especially now, I think. And, and I'm looking to transition from that and get back to my work, form networks of people, support systems, and focus more on my, my creative work. And I think I've relied too much on the institution maybe to do that for me, and it hasn't. So a little bit different um, uh, perspective, I think, here, but it's, I really value your, everyone else's perspective and the work that you've done, so. Oh, well, thank you. Just moving this so that I can get um, better positioned. Well, thank you. Actually, it's, it's, it's similar. Um, I don't see it as so different, but uh, I'm very familiar with academia and how crushing it can be. But I also think there, it's wonderful how you can use it. So we can talk about that. Um, Aaron, thank you, by the way. It's nice to meet you. Aaron Kendrick, are you there? Hi, um, I am actually here on the line. I, I can um, speak a little bit, but you hear that behind me. I am still in a class with kids. <laughs> we're, just, um, we're in the middle of this missile. But um, just to introduce myself, I am a visual artist in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm also obviously an art educator. Cool. Um, that's the dismissal that you hear. They're calling kids out. Um, <laughs> Um, and for me, I really, I don't know, this is fun. So I wanted to join this Zoom just to kind of, sometimes you just want to check in with yourself and see if you're doing things in the best way. Bye-bye. Um, also to, to just pick up some things that I can also pass along to my students. Um, of course, I, um, I know Patrick um, from his glorious days with us here in Jacksonville, and we miss him very much around here. So anything that Patrick puts out there, I'm always you know, willing to jump on and see what I can learn from. Thank you, and good mm -hmm. luck with that class. Thank you. <laughs> so happy that you do that. Sandy, are you there? 
Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, oh, Sandy. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Oh, Hello. 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 There we are. <laughs> I might be on. Um, I am a textile artist. I'm from Connie in Ohio. And I'm actually going to be teaching at Chautauqua in a couple weeks uh, for part of their special studies. Um, I left nursing five years ago to pursue um, art as a career. And so I'm just interested in learning more about uh, the business of art. Um, I do some teaching and uh, with COVID and that my in-person classes have suffered. And so I'm just uh, looking for ways to expand um, either teaching online or um, doing some other other things to boost my income. Well, I think, well, I think ooh, that's ooh, a, that's a, oh, you hear, oh, you hear. There we go. Thanks, Sandy. I think that, nice to meet you. I think that in regard, that in regard, thank you. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> in regard to teaching, you really need to know what the, your mission is and what your talents are, not necessarily skills. Um, and I believe that the key to really good teaching is having a uh, a source that's really different that that stands apart from what's been taught so many years in the past and uh, what I always look for is contemporary approaches which is more rare than not actually um, all right so let's now that I got a really good sense from all of you I really feel grateful um did, did i miss anyone though am i missing i don't believe so okay so i would love to just share my powerpoint with you and get going i just want to share with everyone that the the way that i do things is like a I, it's like turning on a fire hose so please feel free to turn me off and ask a question just jump in if there are any um any inquiries you have i'm going to keep in mind all of what you just said and uh, as we go along and explaining through these um, slides that I'm going to be showing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Uh, if, you, if you can't see that, okay, great, Pamela, thanks. If you can't see it, just uh, feel free to shout out to me. So I think the first thing I want to share with everyone is um, in sustaining a creative life and, and just a little background to on how I know this. So uh, and, and also just to also share that this is just one perspective from a lot of research. Um, this is certainly by by no means um, I'm the only one and um, who I believe in myself as a catalyst to give space for others. And I certainly learn a lot and bring those people with me. So the kind of uh, collection of, of narratives and also um, information I'm passing along is really from collecting from people who I've met in my tours and all of my travels that stopped really in March of 2020, but then they're starting up again and every time in September. And every time I go out into the world, I ask artists what they need, want, and what can they give, and what their goals are. And, and that, fir that first sentence, knowing what your goals, needs, wants, and what can you give, is crucial. And why is it crucial? Because no one is gonna know uh, how to help you unless you know what you need. And I think oftentimes people in the arts are used to just going where everybody else goes, like where um, other artists go or a model that's been presented to us, uh, meaning let's say uh, something very traditional and longstanding for many, many, many years, uh, that's the typical route to go. Well, I mean, just like any highway, that's driven on over and over again, it gets worn out, right? And that usually new um, paving comes down after a while because it gets into repair. And that new paving usually has a wonderful uh, clean, I'm just thinking of asphalt, like a nice clean coat, but it's on top of what was behind. Even if that was dug up, it's still uh, underneath has a foundation. 
So that metaphor is really strong because essentially we're here today and we're not here in the times of let's say poets, writers, theater, in theater, in opera, and in, in the arts, in the visual arts, in the arts in general, um, in the visual arts where, uh, you know, Vincent van Gogh is not alive. We do have cell phones. Um, we do have computers. We have other ways in which to communicate that of certain times where models were established um, are may not be relevant today. And I, I want everyone to think in that way, because once then if you think about those foundations in history are there but they're not maybe as relevant as they are today or used today then what do we have and i i often times hear from artists that they're they're puzzled as to knowing what to do then because they're not thinking they're thinking wow i'm just gonna go in this route that's already been for so long but it really only serves about 99 percent of artists in the world so how can those 99 percent of artists sustain their creative life so the artist and especially at chautauqua visual arts we teach this too um, in how to emphasize and create your own audience in order to sustain your own creative life so answering what your goals are and what I, i'll explain goals after this slide um, your needs and wants, not just financial. It's a given that everyone here needs money to survive. That's not what I mean. I mean, things, opportunities, um, uh, practical professional things that would grow your practices. So meaning that let's say you are like, I believe that Sandy was saying she works in textiles. So if you're working in textiles, what could it be then? What is the context where the work should live? Why, too? Um, how does it get back to the meaning of your work? Um, what is the meaning of the work beyond the material? Um, what does the context have to do with the work? Um, who is the audience for that work? Um, I will also just say to Steve, the uh, idea of, use, uh, of your poetry Poetry is like sort of like jazz music, right? Where it's it's a it's a form art form that's not supported that much. However, the poets that I know always seem to collaborate and have a context for their work that is widely distributed. So how how can you create a context for that work? The key is knowing your audience. So we'll go over this. Um, I'm just giving some highlights. Also knowing who you are and what your capacities are. Oftentimes people, especially after this webinar, people say to me, I can't do all of these things. I was like, that's cool. You know, I, I, I actually think you should live the life you wanna live and not, it's not determined by me, but it's good when somebody says I can't do something because then it says, that says to me, well, are they un uncomfortable doing it or, do they feel like they don't have a capacity? Those are two different things, but it's real for people to not have capacity. So um, in adjusting one's view and saying, okay, what are the realities here and how can I pace myself and what can I do? I think the other thing is in this, it, it really so much of what we do in the arts that's successful is community minded and building uh, relationships. So how do you connect with those people who are like-minded? Um, essential to do the research to find your audience and reaching out in different ways. We'll go over that. Having a specific purpose and reason to connect um, and sharing resources and cultural reciprocity is essential. So what does that mean? It means that let's say uh, Danielle is saying you want to transfer over to being quote, a full-time artist um and want to be able to uh, i guess spend more of a commitment to that endeavor well what are the ways in which you can um and we can discover that together but the first thing is what are the goals beyond just giving up your job i mean and besides money like what's the meaning of your work what's the context of it again and 
uh, who is your community? Having specific reasons and reasons to connect um, mean, means that most people, like 80% of the things that I have gotten in my life have come from cold calls. So meaning that never to pick up the phone and call somebody, but really having, reaching out to be able to take opportunities to connect with another person that is like-minded, that has the same kind of values and same ways in looking at in your circle, the kind of work that you want to do and that you're doing. And that gives um, some inspiration to your practice. Um, finding those people is essential. And having a reason to contact beyond just say, I want you to do a visit, or I wanna just talk about my work. If it's one-sided, I don't think many people will wanna come unless you're paying them. Um, nobody has to serve anybody else. It's really built on those relationships. But we'll talk about specific reasons and being disciplined and determined to stick with meeting and communicate, communicating with your community. Excuse me. Oftentimes people don't, uh, they, they think they want to be able to include people and that's great in the very beginning. And then all of a sudden it, it fades, fades out because somehow it's maybe too much work or doesn't fit in their, the life. But um, you have to decide what, it, it takes work. You have to decide what that work is and then a, what, based on what your goals are and and how you can uh take that information and move forward and i'll try to help you with that okay so let's talk about goals okay excuse me i just needed something to drink there it's a little warm today um i always give this challenge to so many people what if you set up a list of venues or opportunities or context for your work that are realistic, that are professional, that are geared towards a context for the work? So what would that be? I mean, oftentimes people say it's a gallery. People also say a museum. People say um, uh, an outdoor space, a coffee shop. Um, a venue, period. Or in the case of poetry and the other arts would be, let's say, uh, Stephen, a, a book, a journal, a, um, a reading, a poetry reading, um, and many more things. But this is very, very important because setting this up tells you, most of all, who basically, who the people are in your community by the venues that you select. There are people that are behind those venues that are your community, essentially, because if you're choosing those venues, those are the people that you wanna connect with to build a relationship with, to create that, uh, to create that, um, uh, sorry, somebody at the door, create that, uh, uh, community, that audience. Um, so by seeking those venues, and per, they can be by perhaps geography specific individuals, institution, it actually creates like a, a field or a place where you have a mapping. And in that mapping, it can really show or an address book or Excel sheet or what have you, which is the beginning of a database, which I'll get to. It actually holds it somewhere where those goals are um, towards a deadline or practice or, or it's a way of structuring a practice. And the goals are based on those, uh, on the list of places and opportunities and context that your work could exist that, um, that uh, mirror who you want to collaborate with. Now, when I say collaboration, I don't mean somebody working with like absolutely working with your work i mean or changing your work i'm saying people you actually um uh have a business relationship with or creative relationship with so for example could that be a publisher 
Could it be a, a gallery, like I said before? It could be a um, any kind of venue or um, type of industry that actually, um, by working with them, gets the work out into the world. And that is called a collaboration. Um, those people don't serve us as artists, and nor um, do they, nor are they all the same. Just like all of us here have very, very different uh, goals, aspirations, and visions, uh, that is the same with um, uh, so many other people who show artists, who are work with artists um, of all kinds. So through this, you would be able to reach, have 10 goals to reach within a year or five years. And then it's really important to diversify your goals, diversify the venues, diversify the opportunities. I should also say like many opportunities are including like residency programs or um, let's see, uh, uh, getting a studio somewhere or uh, a certain platform or more education. Um, those are all sort of towards uh, a goal of um, uh, growing the work that you wanna get done. And that's the key, is what is going to grow the work that you, um, that you actually want to foster in the world? So let's talk about first um, what your inner talents are. So a lot of artists don't ever really know uh, what they have besides the work that they make. And that's really a shame to me because um, in some ways, well, in all ways, in, in my opinion, you are much more important than your work yourself. You're a living human being you are the catalyst for your work, you're the maker, you're the critic for your work, you're everything for the work. So I think that it's really important to go through these, even though these sound really cliche, there's truth in cl cliche. So if you bear with me, um, what are some sources for validation? Validation, everybody needs validation. Human beings all need validation. And I think that recognizing your assets and your inner talents are a way to, to say, oh, I fall back on this and I'm more than just the work itself. So that includes creative thinking inside the studio, applied to the outside of the studio, meaning uh, uh, ability to solve problems, um, ability to multitask, organize in your own way, uh, the drive to finish, finish projects, um, think out of the box, make something out of nothing, having sensitivity and empathy leading to insights perhaps not seen by others, um, ability to observe and assess, and ability to bounce back from failure easily, among many other inner talents that we all hold uh, within ourselves. Um, I also think that so many artists want validation that it keeps them a certain kind of validation that keeps them actually from living their lives case in point let's say someone um is i don't know in their 80s okay they're 80 years young they've waited for their entire life by putting somebody uh, and a, a gallerist on their web on, on their mailing list They've approached that gallerist. They see other artists who are connected to that gallerist, and yet they're not in that uh, gallery with them. And uh, and they feel like they've been knocking their head against the wall, but they don't know. They don't know, and and they think that that's the only place for them. Well, that's so sad. And it actually happens. I mean, to me, it's heartbreaking because, first of all, by waiting for that validation of being in that circle um, that may appear perceptually to be so amazing, but there's a big difference between perception and, and um, reality. Oftentimes, they're very far apart. And 
even still, if, if some people who are deemed really successful, who are a part of that, um, uh, a part of, let's say, a, a club, a gallery community where you can't get in there, they, they may not be so, quote, successful as you see them. Maybe, it look, even though it looks like it could be very expensive club and very profitable, maybe it's not. And oftentimes that's the case. So I wouldn't fall for that. But I'd ask yourself, why do I need this validation? If I'm not getting it, who do I want to get it from? Uh, why do I have to wait for things? Can I get it myself? So in thinking about your capacity and skill sets, I also think as a form of validation, you don't have to do everything another person is doing. You got to know yourself. Um, and as I said, perception is really different oftentimes in reality of situations. Really important to balance your own time. Oftentimes people um, go on other people's times. And that that's not cool either because if you're rushing for something, I would ask you, what's the hurry for? You could say, well, that person got there very quickly, but they're not you. And it may have just been the universe has a different, uh, a different um, plan for you than you do, which means that maybe perhaps you can pay attention and be open to other things. I think it's also important to be realistic about what you take on at any given time. Be amb ambitious, but with reality checks. Oftentimes I see artists that have big ambitions, but I probably think that they probably won't get there in their lifetime. Um, and that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that there's other things. Uh, reach out where you're comfortable, but not too comfortable. Meaning that if you're only reaching out to people you already know, you may be isolating yourself. So it's a balancing act. So I think it's also important when building an audience, think about what fits. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, for example, if let's say uh, you make really abstract work and you see a gallery that's showing only figurative work, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Do you think that probably your work wouldn't fit in the abstract work category? Probably not. So that's probably not a good fit. And everybody in any kind of creative world is a contributor to that, is, has a creativity, whether even that they're selling tickets or they're um, in facilities of different departments or um, they're in in uh, security they're still part of it physically um but the curators and the publishers and the editors and all the people on the other side also have a vision so is your work looking at the meaning and the visual and the the uh verbal in every aspect of what that is in your work does it match the places and venues that you've selected in your list of goals, does that match where um, it fits? Can we talk about the kind of opportunity venue where you really fit? So I'm just gonna stop for a minute and I wanna have a conversation about this. Wait a minute, not there yet. Okay, we'll come back to that. So with everyone here, just share with me a little bit off the top of your head, what kind of things or goals uh, in this list of goals, that's like under an umbrella goals, what kind of things that, or places or context that you can see for your work and do they fit? What do you think? Just off the top of your head. Stephen? Well, um, a member of my meetup group let, called T Typewriter Let's Workshop or Poetry uh, gave a little talk about a variety of different pub small publishers 
that are open to new po poets, to new work. And um, there's a whole list of them across the country. And so uh, that would be an appropriate place to submit work that they, because their target uh, audience or not, not audience, but they're, 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 they're the artists they're looking for are new artists, are, are, are unpublished, let's say unpublished or, uh, poets and you know small uh, journals, whatnot. So I could see that as a way to focus my attempt to get published and find an audience. But Stephen, what about the content of the work? You didn't say anything about that. Like it's one thing just to have generally publishers that will publish new work, but what about the work itself? Like the fit? Right. Well, I, um, you know, I do a lot of personal poetry. Um, it's, it's for my life experiences. And that's, that's a common theme in my poetry. Uh, that's the main theme, I guess, in my poetry. Okay, so then you would take that content and that would be then, um, that would be your driving force as to figure out what that fit would be. Um, thank you, and what about you, Danielle? What can you think, just one off the top of your head? Interior designers. Uh, I, my work is color, is really color-based and I'm interested in the effect that my abstract patterns, usually grids of squares or circles, has on spaces. That's what I admire in other artists' work. That's what I follow. And it's just this interaction between interiors and art. And so I, I there are interior designers who seem, um, like a good fit but also I showed my work in a stage or somebody for a house in Newport Beach and it was just this beautiful house and she you know she needed art and so I it was just like you know one of those magical moments so yes uh, she actually took uh, several of my pieces and the main one uh, which has came out beautiful photographs so for me the opportunity was just to have photographs of my work in a beautiful space and they actually the people who bought the house bought the artwork too so i was like <laughs> so maybe more of that the staging to be able to put it out there but i think uh, reaching out eventually i'm just building work right now so yeah i haven't this is in so interesting for me you know well, to, i think you have to I think you have to talk about also, again, like I'm probably going to reiterate this to everyone, just like with Steve, is that interior designers, there's a million of them, it mm -hmm. seems. And so your vision is going to have to match with, I'm just going to move my computer, it has to match with the vision Absolutely. of an interior designer. Right. And so what is what is that vision? And And I think that beyond just geometric forms. I yeah. mean, is it also placement of those forms? Is it the texture? And then also why are you creating those patterns? Um, because even in the most abstract work, there's narrative, meaning uh, why is one section of, of a piece have more in a hierarchy priority than another? Sort of like thinking about a movie when you think about a movie, there's usually a a main character and then a supporting cast, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you have an environment that supports it. That's mm -hmm. the same in creating artwork, uh, literary forms, um, theater, uh, any kind of art at all. And so even in the most abstract, there's usually a rhythm to that that creates meaning. So just something to think about. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. Pamela, um, what would you say is a good fit? Yeah, hi. Hi. Let me show up here. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at um, some different things. I think for me, just conversations with my colleagues um, that we talk about our work more than we talk about work problems. 
mm -hmm. is going to be critical moving forward. But I'm looking at moving out of galleries. I don't feel comfortable. Um, it just doesn't feel like a good goal for me. So I'm looking more at outdoor spaces, public spaces. Um, and I found that it's, I recently had a, a continuing um, challenge in, in connecting with scientists in the academic space because they all have their research that they're doing and they just go, oh, can you make an animation for me? And I'm like, that's not what I'm, you know, why I want to talk to you. It's more about my interest in salamanders or something. But I'm finding that reaching out to um, park systems and people who are actually in the environmental area of working are more open to letting me onto the space or letting me join a research trip just to tag along. You know. So that's been my have my my new strategy for just getting to sit alongside of a scientist. My my work is environmental. It's there you about, go. Yeah, reconnecting to the land. I was just um, going to ask you if that was again what I was asking Steve and Danielle. You know, what is the content should be the driver essentially, yeah. because you know everyone. I just want to share with you too is that media serves content. So it's 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 uh, to say that let's say a gallery shows paintings doesn't have any information in that. It's like okay, so what? Um, but particular visions and that connection and harmony to those visions excels one's growth. Um, just a few more. I want to ask other people. Mac, any ideas? The question so the kind of stuff that I, I'm working on right now is uh, grief related and, and it's a narrative storytelling um, and a podcast medium. Uh, so, um, Kind of, a, I've started to do some of that research and uh, look at uh, right. So the the issue has been that podcasting can be done uh, solo, and I would like to do it with more production and uh, like have a bigger team. So that's where my goals are headed towards. Uh, and also, I would like to have it on a platform that you know promotes other would, where it would get promoted. Um, uh, so yeah, I, there's a couple like. Um, like iHeartRadio would be like too big for me, but something like Gimlet or Mermaid Palace or Lemonada is something that I can look into. Um, they, they don't quite have a narrative storyteller, but they do these hyper-personalized podcasting uh, mediums kind of through interesting lenses. So yeah, sort of looking at those, those rosters and seeing if uh, they'd be interested in, in something like that. And that actually, leads me to a question if I can piggyback that and then I'll mute myself um I like in the medium of podcasting it feels very easy to do the research of venue because I can you know they display it really easily for you know people to have access to it not just to research and uh, I would love a recommendation on uh how to do that research on a venue that would be you know, to, you know I'm not a visual artist but how do you do research on galleries or for me how do you do research on um like theaters or uh, people that might want to support uh, like smaller indie screenwriter screenwriter vibes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, great question. I'm going to do that after this. After I'm going to go back to it's ex, ex, exactly the next thing that we're doing is uh, research. So I'll be able to lead that. Um, Kathy, do you have any thoughts though about a fit? Um, I'm sort of. Uh... I guess I, I sort of toggle back and forth between, you know, thoughts about my students and sort of what I share with them. I, I have to say, I agree with you a lot about finding that place where you fit. Otherwise you can, you can feel like you fail when you're actually not, I was just having a conversation with Patrick about this this morning, actually, you can feel like you're failing when actually you're not targeting the right audience for your work. For me personally, um, my work has always, always been more gallery based. It's, um, it's, it's um, in the based in the craft mediums and the medium of metal, but um, it's I'm making objects of connection that are about bridging divide through meticulous work and um, and kind of habits. Uh, it sort of works in, within the context of function, um, but is not in and wearable as wearable jewelry. 
Um, so my fit is probably in the contemporary jewelry world. Um, and I'm hoping to sort of expand out a little more internationally than, than my work has been so far. Fantastic. Um, uh, let's see, Sandy, do you want to say anything? Hi, Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, yes. Um, Ohio Craft Museum, like craft museums, uh, text, there's a textile study groups and there are um, some galleries that focus on textiles. So that's my uh, main focus. Okay. okay. Art, art centers, places where it's kind of like the high end craft is um, uh, featured. Okay, great. Okay, great. Vicki? Vicki? Or, okay, well, I'm not hearing from Vicki, so we'll just keep going. Um, so let me share my screen again. I'm glad that to hear about that. Rachel, do you want to say anything? Nope, okay. Sorry. All right, so share screen. Let's get back to this. All right, so... Oh. So now, um, a daily practice of research. So I find that the first thing um, that I just want to share is is following artists, even though it says guides, blogs, and periodicals. I'll get to that. But Mac, to answer your question, the key is in seeing who you and venues that you really love and places that you really like and people that you really feel connected to through your work you follow them what are their resumes on their resumes what do they say their past that they have taken um in your case mac what podcasts really make a difference for you and then people on those podcasts excuse me that that would tell you a lot so i think that um going from a place where that creativity you can mirror um, and at least get ideas of where to go. Now, when I say um, periodicals, I really mean like on uh, online periodicals or, I mean, I don't think there's many for, I mean, I'm hoping that there's still, and Stephen, you can maybe tell me, is that journal poetry still around? Because I've collected that for years and years and years, or do they stop? No, they're still they're still publishing absolutely all, all different amazing. all different sizes, both uh, online and um, in hardcover. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that's pretty rare. I mean, I think in every um, in every art form there there are some written materials still um, as far as periodicals, and people ask me all the time, why would you want or, or how can you research from a periodical? So I'm just going to show you now. I'm going to keep going in and out of this, if you don't mind. Um, I have to stop sharing, and then I'm going to go right back. And I'm going to go to now share again. Okay. Okay, so this is all my tabs and everything. But let's just go to this. Can everybody see my computer? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so if I go to hyperallergic, is anybody familiar with hyperallergic.com? If you're not, write this down. So hyperallergic is, is really one of the most, uh, widely read, uh, most widely read, um, uh, publications for the arts and in books and films and performances you can see here in the world. And let's say I'm just taking a perusal of this and I go through and the first thing I see are some images. And so when I look at some images that really attract me, I then start to, they jump out at me and then I go to those articles. For people who are wanting to hear podcasts, there's a podcast here and which other recommendations of other podcasts. And also, um, 
as well as other art forms. It's just even Stephen, just poetry or um, the literary is also recognized here. So uh, anything that you feel that uh, has a, um, a, a righteousness that comes back to you. Like in this case, uh, the, oh gosh, sorry, one second. I don't know how I got there. It's just advertisement. Okay, in this case, this popped out to me. And then the first thing I recognize then is the writer, who's actually one of my students. And then this is a subject that is really important to me. So I then, uh, you know, go, go through this and see, and maybe see where this is talking about if it wasn't an opinion piece, but um, uh, it comments on like, for example, the volunteer lawyers for the arts that pops out at me, or if it's like another artist or another museum place or anything that actually besides the writer, that I can grab onto that might have some recognition for me. Um, and then from that, taking that information as research and either following the author or following the artist or whomever uh, or organization that's part of the article, you know, then actually that then um, uh, it, it, it then is something for me to chew on as far as research to then follow them so and see where their path is. So uh, I really think perusing periodicals are really important. Does that all make sense? I, I was very scattered there. I'm so sorry. Let's go back to this. Okay, so back to this. Um, so now, you know, also, uh, looking institutions out of the box. So let's say, and this goes, this, this is really, uh, this slide is centered on a lot of visual arts, but this applies to everyone. Oftentimes institutions, I think, um, are just, are just artists usually go in one door and oftentimes the other doors, if instead of waiting in line for the first door, you can take a journey. This is actually um, very um, metaphorical. You can take a journey around the outside of the building to the back door and get in faster. And through the outside of the building, you get to see the architecture and know who's inside the building um, by taking that journey. I've always gotten in the back door. I mean, unless I have a referral to get me in the first door, but referrals are earned. They're not asked upon usually. So it's like, to me, it's, it's a, it's a I, I always learn through the journey of getting in the back door. Now, what does that mean? It means, for example, let's say you wanna uh, show in a museum or even a, a gallery director, or let's say for, to the literary arts, you want to be able to um, uh, get your work into that journal. Well then you need to have maybe some attention uh, to be able to uh, elsewhere to get to the person that's at the head of the table. So maybe within that institution, there are other people that would pay attention. Usually education departments working for the education department or museum works or having a relationship with somebody else other than that top person that you can grow with and have a relationship with that then enters you into that team. Um, I think also when you're checking out places like university museums or organizations that have sub departments, um, to me, like for example, a university museum has faculty that make those decisions, but oftentimes faculty are never approached. It's only usually the top people in the museum. And I actually always like the community effort of going in the back door because I have then the opportunity to meet more people that also need a source of validation because they aren't necessarily looked upon traditionally than those other people. Um, and usually by doing so, 
is an opportunity to yield other opportunities and collaborative opportunities. I think it's also important to be open and fluid if the goals that and venues that you set up for yourself, they may change because the more that you navigate a path, the more you have an opportunity to go off that path onto a side road into a community you've never seen before. So I think being open is really wonderful. And the base, the key is the meaning of your work and what that is and how that can fit with others. Um, really try to be realistic about the appropriate context for your work and go outside the traditional path. So before we end today, I'll put in the chat, just to get your research started, a link to my website where there's a bunch of resources that you can um, use to get going. So um, I always appreciate a good database. Uh, so let's say you're doing this research and you know this takes time. Some people have said to me, they said, you know, Sharon, how do I make my work when it takes so much time to do all this other stuff? Well, I don't think it takes that much time because if I'm organized first, like uh, I, I normally live in New York City except for three months out of the year. So for nine months out of the year, I live in New York City. And before COVID, I would be taking the subway. And when I was on the subway, I'd have my iPhone and I would go through and have my investigative research hat on. And uh, I would have a piece of paper next to me. And I would actually jot down names and contact information and of the people that I'm researching that I feel like I could date or I could, I mean, I'm happily married. I mean, uh, metaphorically date or get to know. And those people then form an audience. But what's good and it's less time consuming is to be organized and intentional. So another, another intentional way of actually physically doing this is everybody has to eat. And maybe during your eating, you have a computer with you and you have a place to put research that could be uh, like uh, share, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, there's so many, um, like there's ACT, there's uh, many different CRMs that you can use. Uh, there's, there's, even just a basic address books that come with a Mac or um, basic uh, Excel sheet or even a Word document, somewhere to put this stuff because then you don't have to repeat it. And if it goes into a database, you then have a currency to then reach out to them. But this is it, where it comes, it, it holds that community and your audience um, that you're choosing based on the content of your work and your goals. Um, and uh, to me, um, it is so easy then to be able to reach for and to have um, a place to know what what I'm what I need at any given moment as far as staying up, up in touch with people that then have um, the capability for me to collaborate with uh, that can, um, with that collaboration, enhance the growth of my work in the venues that I see. And here's an example of what my current database looks like, which is ACT, which um, is uh, problematic for me now. It's actually expiring and, um, I'm going into another um, big program and I'll show that probably next time I'm with everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm in this huge uh, mammoth uh, transition in going from ACT where I put notes in and I put various different information about um, these individuals that I find that I collect, sort of like a diary, but it's also like my BFF that once I have that information and I put it in my database, I don't have to think about it anymore because then I can just, just go right to work. And also a good database, a good CRM really, really actually uh, tells you based on what you share with yourself, um, for yourself in the database, what your calendar is like, how that connects to the people you want to connect with, 
So for example, let's say you send a newsletter out, putting down the names of the people that you send a newsletter to so that that's another form of a conversation. A conversation doesn't end just because someone's not getting back to you. Everybody has a different pace. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. So um, I wanna get into notes on a good website because having tools is essential. And that, that includes even for Steve and for you and for Mac and anyone, anybody should have in my recommendation, a website. A website is really, really different than Instagram because Instagram is, is sort of like, it's like a river. It's just there and you're showing information that you're currently putting up, but oftentimes there's not a context um, except within itself. And also I always say about social media, social media is about sharing and it's not about necessarily um, uh, just promotion. Uh, social means sharing, social means social in social media. But I don't know if you knew that the average attention span is between five and eight seconds for a website. So you would paying attention. These are just even listening and asking questions like, how did this person get there? Um, what path did they take? Um, following their uh, like I said, their resume and trajectory. That's really important because those kinds of insightful questions and curiosities can land you um, a community that can actually contribute a community to you. Um, so before I heavily go into this website, I want to be able to stop soon because uh, we would then be, let's say an, uh, an hour and 15 minutes and I wanna leave time to be able to um, uh, answer questions about this segment. And then we are definitely gonna have to have three, at least three segments, because the next thing we'll talk about in addition to website is we're gonna start to talk about how to reach out, points of good correspondence, reason to contact, creating opportunities, developing relationships, snail mail in person, and a note about thank you notes and more. So that I think was a lot of information to sort of absorb in uh, a short period of time. And I just want to ask people, how, did, how does this help you in this, in this uh, with your work in this time in your life? And is anybody willing to do this uh, wonderful dive into this list of 10 things that they want to share next time? Anybody? Okay, Mac is putting fingers up. Anybody else? Danielle, you uh -oh. would do it? I'll give it a shot. What, what's your hesitancy? Um, I'm just not afraid I can come up with 10. I, it's just. <laughs> I think you'll probably actually come up with probably, just I have an itch in my back, sorry, probably more than 10. Okay. So if you start thinking about, like, think about this, some good fits, like interior designers, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what are other places? Are there corporate clients? How about architects? Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about um, universities or public art? Um, have you thought about, with your work, a book or publishing of that? Um, have you thought about other media that would then circulate more to go back to the media that you work in? Have you thought about a different kind of studio or maybe um, working in a facility that in a residency that would enable you a new body of work? Uh, I have some limitations. Um, I have a son who's got um, disabilities, so I have to ha I, I have to be here. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's mild, so it's I'm lucky, um, and uh, also my work ends up being pretty heavy because there are a lot bunch of pieces, and so I'm sort of limited. I've limited myself to California when I'm applying to galleries, but it's also like for the time being, I'm not 
ready to expand very far. So I have a distancing, but I media wise, there's a lot I can do and I, I have to think about it. Yeah. yeah it's going to take time. I think that one of the reasons why I like doing this in segments is it's a lot to think about. It's and, wonderful. <laughs> pardon me. I said it's wonderful. I just don't even know how lucky I am that I just came across your link. <laughs> <laughs> it's really about so I think it's, thank you, but I think it's really about self examination. Yeah. Because people can refer you to places and you could ask people where where do you think and where where should I go? Mm -hmm. But why are you giving power so much to another person that may not know you as well as you do or doesn't know you as well as yourself? Mm -hmm. Because I would just say context for work have a lot lot more to do with you individually rather than the work itself so meaning that who are the kinds of people that you want to see this work and don't say everybody because i don't know who that is mm -hmm. so and it's impossible to have, have everybody right mm -hmm. so if it is in california that's a limitation but all limitations to me have all boundaries um, are good because then it ropes in and specifies things more. But what kind of communities in California, for example, uh, what type of communities, who are they? Who are the interactions that you wanna have? Um, also, what's the kind of space that you wanna be in a context with other artists? A lot of questions. I have a question about databases. I bought a year more ago just get your shit good. together. It's That's for artists. Is good. that good? Yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever, whatever works for you. I mean, I like a CRM because it's heavy duty and it can really handle a lot of information. What is a CRM? It's a contact resource management system. And that's usually used for like salespeople or small businesses. Um, so they have a lot more of a facility to be able to manage uh a lot more written material and that's just because of me i'd like to write notes all the time and remember people um and it, it really benefits me in the moment um so and and it benefits me in such a way that it's sort of like having a an assistant right there for me i see mm -hmm. anybody else have thoughts about want to take this journey to do these just make up 10 ideas that would be good context for your work and then try to do the research that would back them up that would then mirror people to those venues. Okay, well, maybe you'll think about it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the next time we do this, I'm going to get into these other tools and then also yield towards self-promotion and creating your own self-DIY uh, opportunities uh, and also uh, reaching out, the mechanics of reaching out to uh, the people that you wanna connect to. And I'm really happy to take that dive with you. So I would say between now and then, it might just be a good idea just to dip your toe in the research ocean and um see what that's like and see where it takes you and i always find it to be so much fun so i wish you well on that journey of sailing on that beautiful ocean and see what kind of fish that you catch and you want to maybe put back in the ocean or maybe you want to take in if if you're not a pescatarian but i i think whatever uh, just metaphorically, there's just so much riches out there. And just to get a taste of it, it may give you different ideas about what your goals are. Thank you. Sharon, I want to thank you so much for the first step in this journey with us this evening. Um, you know, my goal between now and the 19th is to make sure there's more eerie artists present in this session. Uh, I think it's fantastic that we've reached so many artists from throughout the nation this evening and thank you all for joining us but i can't help but have it be reflected back to me that we only had one artist from erie actually in this uh zoom session so i have my own homework between now and the 19th but i would like to encourage you all to mark your calendars uh for august 19th 
6 p.m. Eastern time for our next session with Sharon, where she'll continue on uh, this journey with us. And uh, we will have an Eventbrite page live, as well as a blog post within Erie Arts and Culture's website, where we will be promoting that uh, session. Um, and if you have any questions between now and then, feel free to reach out. Yeah, Sharon. I'm going to share with everyone these resources that I said. Um, so I'll put this in the chat room in the chat room right now. Um, in the chat, if you can just go to that really quickly and capture this link. And these are my resources. This is for everyone towards opportunities, whether that be grants and um, other opportunities uh, that you Fulbrights and to apply for residency programs. Uh, anything that you want to be able to research, it's pretty updated at this point. Um, so I would welcome that. I put that on my site because I want to help other people in, um, in the creative uh, communities. Um, and I would just say that's a good base. And then also um, a big part of this, uh, these webinars, if you will, and conversations is that um, creating these paths, you never know who can actually uh, open the doors for you, even the people that are here together with us as a community. So if people are game, I'm really thrilled to be able to um, connect you all together. And Patrick, I'll talk to you about that later too, if that's possible, um, so that people can share their own resources um, to to see what people have in common and, and create different paths within this community. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, we will see everybody again, hopefully on August 19th at 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, for the next session with Sharon. Uh, and again, the, these web sessions are funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts through their Artworks program. And we are thankful for that support and thankful for you all joining us. And until next time, uh, be well. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the resources. Have a great time with that information. I hope it's not too overwhelming. Thanks for having me. I'll see you soon. It's lovely to meet all of you. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening for the second session of Mechanics to Sustaining a Creative Life, uh, presented by Erie Arts and Culture as part of our pro network. Uh, we welcome this evening to our virtual space Sharon Loudon, who is joining us from the Chautauqua Institution in uh, New York. Sharon is a uh, artist and author and uh, arts advocate, a arts administrator, uh, and so many other things. And, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. For those who haven't um, participated or viewed the first session, uh, please know that you're jumping into session two this evening. Uh, but we do have the first session available through Erie Arts and Culture's blog, which is erieartsandculture.org slash blog. There you will find uh, the video session um, from Sharon's um, first part of this presentation. It's also on Erie Arts and Culture's Facebook, where this is being live streamed this evening. Uh, our pro network webinars are uh, funded in part by the National Endowment Through the Arts through their Artworks grant. And we're very uh, appreciative of that support. Without any further ado, uh, I want to hand it over to Sharon so that she can pick up where she left off last time. Thanks so much, Patrick. And thanks for having me here. And thanks for everybody being here today. Um, last week, we talked about um, the idea of having about a list of 10 um, goals, if you will, or I, I use that word uh, loosely, but um, diversifying or having ideas as to you know what you where you want to be what you want to do with your work um and also yourself and I, I just want to be able to say that um in doing that exercise and again and I'm really grateful to Patrick for uh, those of you who missed last week to be able to see that um to to give you a context from the last uh time we were together but um, I also want to just talk about values for a moment. Um, I think values are really, really important and um, selecting the kind of people that you want to be able to have a conversation with, um, be able to collaborate with, and collaboration doesn't necessarily mean uh, changing your work, but it can mean so many different things 
uh, like just working with somebody, whether it be um, for, for your work or your life in either an exhibition, concert, performance, whatever it is, that you're working in collaboration with someone if you're working with anyone, in my view. So how, how, I mean, to me, the power is up to all of you to be able to select those people that, that match your vision as much as possible. That's where it starts. Um, and you're the only one who can make those determinations. Now, people can give you lots of referrals, but I do think that it lands on you at the end of the day. So many artists, I think, in every artistic field, um, I, I see that take referrals and not pause. Um, they just go right for it because it skips right to the front of the line if there's a referral that happens. And sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's not so great. Um, and I, I just want to be able to um, make sure that everybody knows here that just as a reminder that you all have the power um, to be able to make those decisions and choose your audience um, from the very beginning. So that is just coming from where we were, we left off last week, but for the people who were here last week, did anybody attempt to do that research by chance? And if you didn't, not a big deal. I mean, you need to allocate some time for that, but usually only takes about 15 minutes a day to build, uh, at least for me, to build up a, a really good audience um, and uh, currency, which is a mailing list. Anybody have any thoughts from last week? If not, I'll go right to the next thing. Mac? Yeah, I just, I just made a list of some networks that I've been interested in contacting and, and that felt right in line with this thing that you sort of said with values and then uh, the names and the contact information. Podcasting, the narrative podcasting, podcasting world is actually quite small. So I have access to all of that stuff. And then this thing that you had touched on with kind of going in the about section or seeing who is like an assistant to something or uh, like a co-producer on something, making those names too, because I actually knew a lot more of these names than I thought I did. So it was just, I don't, and I went all sorts of creepy ways, like, you know, IMDb to Instagram to Google. And um, yeah, it was just, it was really, uh, it made it feel accessible, like possible and daydreaming something that I don't do. Like some people maybe just go from like zero to being famous. I have trouble like daydreaming about the next step or envisioning the next step. And uh, this just like made things, I, it allowed me to see maybe what the next step is. So um, it was very, like all, I, I decided I love researching now, which is something that went from zero to 60. It always felt like something you had said even last week of like, God, I'm wasting so much time researching. Um, so it was a gift this week. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for that great feedback. I, I'm with you. I love researching because it is an opportunity to, see who's out there. And just that reaffirmation, what you said, the validation of seeing these names and digging deeper and to be able to then have these people right in front of you in a place, um, meaning like an Excel sheet or I don't know what, how you organized it, uh, but that all, to me, it, 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 it all is very, very productive. Um, I would just say though that I don't find it creepy at all, even though I can see how you would say that because all that information is out there anyway. So if people didn't wanna be contacted, they would, they would not be out there as they are. Um, and so I always think about the fact that um, because it's public, it's an invitation. And that's what I, I rather think that way than it being exclusionary. Um, some people actually say to me, they actually ask this question to me. I get this often. Um, you know, wh how how do I feel about taking an email address and putting on a mailing list when that's against a lot of uh, spam laws? Well, if you look at the Spam Act, it is really uh, for people to be uh, solicited for money. If you're sharing something with another individual, that you're not coming from that place, but a place of connecting through community, 
I don't feel like it is a spam uh, opportunity at all. It is more of an opportunity to connect with uh, within a community. And um, as I mentioned last time, um, I always find uh, cold calling, not calling physically, but cold communicating, let's just put it that way, um, to be really effective if you have in your gut and your research matching up who your audience is. Um, so that, that, and you can only go with what you feel and what you know, but we don't know what we don't know. So I, I feel like if you just keep tapping in and keep building that and researching, you are going to find more of your audience if you haven't already. So thanks for sharing that. That is awesome. Um, and, you know, I, for, for me, I have a really big mailing list that I keep building. Um, I think I mentioned it last time. It's in, it's about 20,000. No, it's 17, about 17 thousand people, but that's over the course of 10 years. And um, I really love adding to it and researching. And there's some kind of comfort in my crazy mind that to, to feel like I that there are 17,000 people out there who are amazing that I want to be able to connect with. I'm sure there's millions. But in the meantime, that's all I've been able to, to be able to capture. Um, anybody else, Danielle, did you have any success or um, with it, but I understand if you didn't have time or anything about that. I didn't really get into the nitty gritty, but what struck me was how you had uh, said to to uh, to have a variety, and yeah. I think mind was way more open than it might have been. And I just realized that I do have a lot of different uh, possibilities. I talked to, I dropped off some things at the framer. The framer started telling me about interior designers and blah, blah, blah. The photographer who I took some work to, uh, I realized that, I mean, I came up with 10 things, uh, at least like you said, <laughs> like, I don't think I can. Uh, the person who, the stager for the interiors, uh, she contacted me and said, she's got another uh, place in downtown LA, the loft that they were trying to wow. stay. Wow. So it's like all of a sudden, all these various little ding, ding, ding are lighting up. Good. Other things that I've been putting on the back burner because I'm not good enough or I'm not having the, so, um, but the, I'm getting close. I have a contact with the editor in chief of an interior magazine and she's an old neighbor and I don't know why I'm just getting in my head. So I just have to um, uh, just sort of follow up on a bunch of things and then do the research, the nitty gritty of and then maybe put together a po postcard or something like you were saying, books, not ready for that, but uh, there are some other artists who have put together maybe from um, galleries. Anyway, so it, it, it started me going, but I, I have a lot, of, I have research to do and. Um, I think it's so great. Well, first of all, you are, I don't even know you, but everyone here and everybody is good enough. So I just don't believe that. Um, I think every human being is, is 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 enough um and uh i i actually i truly believe that um and i believe everybody has their own audience and it's just a matter of of connecting with that audience but i do think part of the responsibility is um you you know in in be able to locate those people and you never know if if people don't want to connect i mean obviously i mean it's it's sort of like like I, I haven't dated in a long time, but I'd imagine it's it's like dating, you know, where um, some matches may not happen for timing or otherwise. And oftentimes we don't know uh, what's going on with the other person, especially if it's a professional contact from the outside and not knowing them. Um, but you can only do the best that you can in having the confidence in yourself and your work enough to be able to connect with them. So I'm so proud of you and congratulations for having all these fireworks. It seems I was visualizing everything that you were talking about. So good for you. You've got to follow up on it. Please right. do that. Instagram, I use it sort of as a research tool to sort of expand and see what other people are doing and inspire. And I have contacted with a few other artists. It's kind of like a family of art. Some people who do things that are 
in the same uh, sort of idea. So it's it feels like the world is a little bit less big by reaching out. So it feels. I great. think that's so great. It's so fun to do that too. I mean, I, as a visual person, I absolutely love seeing what other people are doing, and I feel really honored to be able to um, even have time to do that, and uh, really grateful. Um, and that's the other thing too. If you have time and you're in positions where you have time, use the time because that's a privilege. Um, and using that privilege uh, means that, uh, you know, to be able to really dig in and take advantage of that um, makes sense. Uh, and also just to grow a community, um, no matter, it's contributing to the community. Um, Okay, so anybody else want to comment on, oh, the other people, no one else is here from last week, but I would just say with Freddie, Sheila, and Mary Beth, um, take a look at that first, uh, the first program that we did, and if you have questions or anything you want to be able to relate to your personal own experiences, feel free to shoot me an email, happy to, to entertain anything you'd like to ask. But in the meantime, I'm going to go right to, whoops, that's my chat. Uh, I'm going to go to share my screen and go to this PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I actually don't really like doing a lot of sort of cookie cutter professional development. Um, let's see here. Let me just get slideshow. Sorry. Uh, whoops, slideshow from current slide. I don't really like doing cookie cutter professional development, mean, meaning that I, I find that, um, that fundamental things are, are obvious sometimes, but then they're so important that it is really, really important to be able to talk about uh, websites and, uh, uh, you know, and to, uh, talk about some some fundamental things that are important. Um, I think everybody in the world should have a website. I think um, making it easy for people to contact you is going to benefit you. Um, I think I've I've found that uh, uh, many people have mentioned to me that a frustrating thing is if they want to contact you and they can't uh, or they don't find it to be so easy. Uh, they give up very quickly. And, and for me as well, I think having a great website where you have a really good about page, a bio page, um, contact information, and also in your contact information, have social media uh, so people can tap into all different ways in which they can contact you that's comfortable for them. Um, it's really funny. Some people, uh, I don't know if you found this or not, but some people like to contact through LinkedIn or other uh, Instagram message. I mean, it's just tr tremendous how many sources there are to uh, be able to contact people. Even with everybody here, Facebook Live, um, some people prefer uh, contact to be able this way versus email or phone or otherwise. Um, I actually love the phone still. I guess I'm old or something, but I really love the phone because I like hearing somebody's voice. Um, make sure if you have your resume on your website, include a downloadable bio and, and resume as a PDF because um, sometimes people like to use that or have it on hand as they wish. Um, make sure you have selections of your work and um, it could be organized by different ways if you wanted to. Uh, and, and this is what I've, I've mentioned here is for an artist, but for any kind of musician or other art forms, it applies to making it cross reference or cross disciplined is gonna be really advantageous and making it as easy as possible to navigate in your website um, and a good to have a news page as well. Um, Okay, hold on. Whoops, second. Okay, um, so I wanted to just talk about like the cold call for a minute not, uh, or cold conversation or cold communication, if you will. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, once they have an audience, how do they really reach out? 
And um, I found there's a, a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, a couple ways are add them to your mailing list and send off like an email newsletter three or four times a year. Um, what I've found that the most successful newsletters are, are very brief um, and letting your website do the work. So meaning that um, the, the newsletter, if you send out by email, it would just have points that would have links to your website within photographs um, and uh, also um, embedded in some paragraphs or references to things that are happening. Um, and, and I also feel like really good newsletters that I've seen are effective in that they're not just very cold. Like they actually say, hello, they say, how are you? Um, they, they make me feel like I'm the only person that's receiving that email from them. There's something to that. I really just want to share that for a minute, uh, talk about that for a minute. Even if you're sending something out mass, that's mass distributed, uh, what I found is that if you do just simply say hello or thank you at the end, it goes a long way. And, and that's just like, uh, maybe sounds really old fashioned, um, but it, it, it's just about being human. Uh, it's about referencing the other person on the other end of who you're reaching. And it's interesting because um, people have asked me, well, that's just, or said to me, that's not so professional, but what's not professional about that? That's what I ask them. Is it, is it that you need to be cool and uh, just have an announcement? Uh, some people used to just send me attachments and nothing there. Well, if, 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 my philosophy is if you're going to be that lazy and not say hello, or just send me an attachment. Why should I do the work to open it? Uh, the other thing is don't ever send attachments because I found that people don't want to open them. And rather than them doing the work to open them, why don't you just have them go to your website so that you can lead them to your website to stay on that website? Um, the average amount of time that people stay on a website is between five and eight seconds. So you have to be able to have ways in which you can keep them there. Again, very easy navigation is going to be helpful. Cross navigation, uh, very uh, good organization. And then in a very friendly newsletter uh, to also share just enough that goes onto your website uh, and not so uh, labored so that people have to keep scrolling down to find things. Uh, I've also found, found that newsletters are really wonderful when they're interactive, when you have some video or you click onto an image and then it goes somewhere. Um, those are just some thoughts to keep in mind. Um, and then also finally having a reason to contact somebody. Uh, very, very important. Um, if you're just, you know, basically saying hello and, uh, and just sending a newsletter asking somebody for someone, that's probably not gonna fly. Um, remember, everybody, including yourself, is really busy. So uh, I think having an announcement of something uh, that's an event or something that's uh, worth announcing um, that you're really proud of, um, is super great to be able to get out there in the world. Uh, I, I find that having a newsletter is about sharing and it's not, I don't find them to be, I think the most successful ones to not be opportunistic, uh, but also very easy to understand and to digest very quickly. Um, and uh, I think another way just to start a conversation is obviously send an email or a note. Um, I send tons of letters in the mail because uh, I not only enjoy doing that and um, find it to be a nice slow way of contacting people uh, on their own time, uh, but also unusual now that people don't really send things in the mail. I think it's also great when you want to be able to contact with somebody who you really appreciate and respect to show up, attend, and correspond with them. Um, I found that just having the courage to be able to effectively say to somebody, wow, I really appreciate what you're doing here, 
or, um, you know, validation goes a long way. Like, um, if you really do appreciate what somebody's doing, why not tell them? I just don't understand why people don't do that enough. Um, I think if you create a possibility or opportunity, having a reason like that is going to be really great. Um, and then another thing I found, which is not on this list is, uh, which before I get to social media is, think about every platform that you have as a place of privilege, like I do. I think of every single platform I have as a place of privilege. And I really believe in sharing those places of privilege. So every time I send a newsletter out, I try to send opportunities, whether they're on my website, which is what Patrick sh shared with you before, um, a link to a resources that I've built on my website or uh, to share with others, uh, which we update pretty frequently um, or just special shout outs in uh, having uh, an opportunity to share with those many people on my mailing list. However, few people that you have, uh, the more that I think that is shared out there in the world, I, I think naturally people gain attention uh, for, for that. And there, there is also the option, opportunity for cultural reciprocity. Um, important to be able to communicate on social media. Social media means social, which doesn't just mean promotion. Um, those of people who just do promotion, I think could be quote very, I don't even know what success means. Uh, everybody has a different definition, um, but uh, I find, him, find it to be a repetitive and oftentimes difficult to, um, keep going back to people's website, I, I mean, Instagram uh, or social media when they're really just talking about themselves uh, constantly. Uh, whoops, that, that wasn't there, wait a minute. Uh, and I also think with social media to follow, comment, participate and communicate, um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a long conversation. It just means that you wanna say hello or um, wow, this is great, or, or push the like button. Uh, those, those things are very effective, um, but commenting and also sharing other people's work uh, is very important. Um, and also sharing other people uh, is great. So I think points of good correspondence in sustaining a creative life. I mean, I do think correspondence is a backbone of any, uh, any kind of uh, feel, any field really. And fundamentally in creating that audience and community but staying in touch with them is going to be uh, incredibly important. I, I would wanna just say something to everyone too is that everybody has a different pace and time. Uh, and I, 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 I think it's unfair actually uh, when um, uh, people, uh, don't, when people get frustrated when they don't hear back from somebody, um, ask yourself, uh, did you, did you send something out that would, uh, demand a, a answer? Uh, that's one question. Another question would be, is it time sensitive? Um, is it, uh, something that requires an answer for you? Probably not. Uh, and then I would ask you, what's your expectation of that person? Um, I think artists get really disappointed when they send something out and they don't have an immediate response. And I, I don't think that people should necessarily be disappointed. I would ask yourself, what are you wanting out of that person? Um, everyone wants to connect with somebody. And you know, I, I, one of my favorite people that I would love to have dinner with um, is a politician. And she is just extraordinary. Like I would just die to, to well, I don't wanna die. I would like to be alive to sit with her and have an amazing conversation. Um, if I sent her an email today and didn't hear back from her after a week, uh, how could I actually be disappointed knowing how many constituents she has as a Senator uh, and then in, in addition to that, how can I really realistically be disappointed in if I were just to say to her, let's have dinner together. Um, I would like to just uh, meet with you and not give something of a, um, 
uh, uh, cultural reciprocity that, that would answer what would be good for her to be able to have an exchange. Um, oftentimes, I think artists ask for things without having um, the tiny steps that come before that ask of just even uh, mentioning why they're having uh, reaching out and uh, what is it about that person that they're trying to, con why they're trying to connect with them and also not necessarily uh, wanting to connect with them just, just for the artist who's, just for, um, I'm, I'm getting caught up without examples, the artist contacting somebody, let's say a gallerist and asking that gallerist to show them, but yet not having uh, the, the, even the steps beforehand to get to know them. Um, and some people may say to me, well, how do you get to know somebody when you're just in a, in a cold correspondence? Make it conversational. Uh, you know, you can, you can uh, mention what they do or what you like about their program and why you're writing to them. What is it about them that makes it important for you to reach out to them at this moment? And a little bit about you and your work and leave with an action. How do you wanna follow up or suggest to follow up? Um, I, I think studio visits or meetings or conversations, uh, which normally would have taken place in the 17th and 18th century do not apply today. So even in the 50s and 60s, and I, I'm actually not being sarcastic. I think a lot of people, especially artists, still think about those days in the back of their mind subconsciously, that when they're either out of school or professional, to think that um, you can have a meeting with somebody uh, on uh, that everybody's time is the same, but also uh, if you are trying to get in touch with somebody or have a meeting with them when they have office hours, it doesn't make any sense. Um, they're probably gonna be really busy and uh, especially if you know that they're working. Um, so having other alternatives as suggestions might be helpful. I do think for artists, a studio visit is something that is an old idea. Um, a studio visit is a very, very precious uh, an important conversation to have that's oftentimes I think rarer these days than it was back in the day, uh, meaning that a definition of a studio visit of an artist or ha uh, having a meeting with someone who um, can yield an opportunity. Um, to me, that studio visit doesn't have to be so much about the person who's visiting, but actually just can be a coffee or a tea or even online, like it's oftentimes now, even before COVID, um, a lot of people were doing online visits, even with people who are just visual and taking on uh, what we know now is very familiar, which is on Zoom, which we're in on right now. I do think notes when you're sending notes to pay attention to gratitude, which I live by every day. Gratitude means also extending a conversation. Um, when thanking somebody, it means that, and, and even thanking somebody and then citing a little bit about the conversation that you had um, with that person, it, it just keeps the, the conversation going. And having that bridge from a meeting into the future, some people may really uh, uh, appreciate that enough to come back to you and continue that conversation. But it's up to you, especially if you're asking for a meeting, to be able to circle back and have a conversation uh, or a thank you note. Now I'm just gonna turn my camera a little bit and show you um, down on the bottom here. You can see all of my notes that I'm writing here. Tremendous amount of notes. Um, those are supposed to go out tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure what 25 notes right now that I have to send out. Um, also, I think it's really important to um, phrase good correspondence by being, you know, language is very important and it always has been. Uh, but somehow I think creative people forget that. Language is important because 
uh, it frames a, a, uh, an attitude, a feeling, a, a um, environment, a, a presence, and even just saying, dear so-and-so and saying, hello, how are you? Or I hope this is finding you well. Um, and referencing something of the day. Like I, I would talk to people last year about COVID and excuse me, some people wanted to send a cold call to again, cold call, uh, correspondence to somebody and not even reference it. And I just thought that was really insensitive. Like every person on this world in this world is is subject to what's happening in the world in it as a common thread. Um, but just even referencing something that's happening around us comes from a place of empathy and compassion. So setting up something that is uh, sensitive to that, it lays a groundwork that we're not in the times that we've been in before, but also it's not medicinal and the setting of a tone could be more personal enough to add layers there on top of that um, because of that empathy. Um, at the end of a letter, I think it's really important not to read sincerely because banks send emails uh, out asking for money and they end in sincerely. Um, what are other ways to say, uh, to, to be able to say um, uh, thank you and ending a letter? You never, I always say this, you never want to say with hugs and kisses. I mean, that's a little bit uh, too much. You know, that to me, I would imagine is too much, even though you are not too much, but I would think that perhaps you may not be very close with them enough to be able to share uh, some, uh, a physical uh, meta a metaphor to something or, or allude to something that's physical. Um, but something like with warm regards, with my warmest thanks, uh, yours sincerely, or uh, something with uh, something that would uh, share kindness at the end and between those two in the beginning of a letter and then an end of a letter creates a wonderful two bookmarks for then assures that the content of the letter will be warm and yet professional. Um, so again, I said, I think it's really important to have a reason to state um, why you're contacting people. And it could be like just to start a dialogue, um, to introduce your work to them, like a warm in invitation. Uh, also invite them to a happening, a reason to reach out as a deadline is always the best. Um, because that yields then to something that a response in a timely fashion. When there isn't a response in a timely fashion, it's because maybe that wasn't established before. Um, create a position to include people you want to collaborate with um having uh an event or something that's a that um uh extends cultural reciprocity i think that's really important uh leaving with an action a letter uh don't assume also someone is going to know what you want uh that ha don't have them do all the work so i personally get very annoyed with people who write me and they say, even if they have a referral, they, <laughs> I get these letters almost every day. Uh, they say, um, I'm doing this project, but they don't give me a reason why I should really care. And then also um, they don't even, they say, well, I look forward to hearing from you, but they don't, yeah, they don't give me a reason why I should even do that work. Um, so that's extremely annoying, uh, especially to, I think to busy people. Uh, the point of all this is to think about the other person. Big success in sustaining a creative life is that cultural reciprocity, but also having the equipment to be able to, uh, and tools to be able to reach out fluidly um, to sustain a creative life. It very, very, very important is to constantly have, um, these balls in the air. And, and some people may think that, wow, Sharon, it's a lot of work to do this, right? It's not. It's about really having, in my mind, it's not. And I respect people's thoughts that it may be, but it's really just a matter of thinking differently. Um, 
the people that are in my books who have sustained a creative life um, in, in every aspect of what they're doing, they're really generous to other artists. And, and they're, they're also grounded in what, what they're doing, meaning that um, they're living step to step to step rather than step to leap. Uh, and to me, we walk, we, we, I don't think that it's normal for us to run every day, right? Uh, I think that generally people walk places in, 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 in a normal life. Um, and Matt, you were saying before, like uh, to go from, you know, zero, I'm just using paraphrasing zero to a hundred or, uh, you know, go to being quote f famous. Uh, first of all, fame and success is always uh, very, um, uh, is, is uh, arguable and people have different definitions of that, how they subscribe to what that means to them individually. But I, I think that the faster, generally the faster you get somewhere, the faster you're gonna be leaping back. So faster forward is the, as much time as going back rather than really having your footing and metaphorically stepping forward uh, as much uh, in, in very measured ways. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think just never assuming someone knows what you want. So even if you are contacting somebody and it's very clear what they do, um, emphasizing what you would like to do with them, but not dictating it. Uh, because if someone has their own business, uh, they're going to make a decision as to what they do with you, just like you're going to make a decision as to what you do with them. So a uh, good example would be if an artist contacted a gallery and said, I really want to show with you, um, that's really awesome and would be really nice to say that, but it might be uh, to asking why. And then uh, to me, um, what that means to you, but, but also just asking that in the cold call is, is jumping forward. Uh, many steps, sort of like um, in dating, I, I really want to um, uh, make love to you the first day I see you. So um, that sort of may not work with some people, but may work with some other people, but how do you know you're even attracted to them? So uh, steps in the long view really make a difference. So talking about creating opportunities. So I, I think it's also good to create your own opportunities and not wait for them. Um, so let's just talk about developing relationships and the best way to correspond via email. And um, these are not my um, preferences necessarily. These are coming from uh, a survey of people that I've spoken with as preparation for what I'm doing today. And uh, as I always do for any of the webinars that I give. Um, but I've always found finding sending announcements every now and then, but keeping them brief. If you're sending an announcement of an event, make sure you send it um, enough beforehand that, that it's not so early that people won't forget. I think um, a, a lot of people get emails in their box, in their box and never look at them. And then if you send it so early, people just, they might be so busy that they may not be able to um, remember what that was. Um, I think subject lines are not an exact science, and but what I have found that are great subject lines are things that are coming out of the conversation, uh, like uh, have you heard of this or um, something with an exclamation point, but then other people have told me exclamation points, slow emails and go into spam. I think you can do some research and tests as to what works for you. But I do know what doesn't work are just, you know, really boring um, subject lines like news <laughs> doesn't really say anything about the content, like something that would uh, uh, reflect the content or maybe it's some exciting news. Uh, when I put something that says opportunities in an email, when I'm sharing that, it gets a lot of notice because generally people want opportunities. And if you have them to give, that is so great. And even if you think you don't, you usually, everybody does, whether that be 
um, taking time to listen to somebody or look at their work or meet them for coffee. And if you're sharing this with your mailing list that you've developed by that are reflective of your goals by doing the research, why wouldn't you wanna do those things with them? Again, having a website to, to re refer to is essential. Uh, I don't think it's, I think it's really important to include interesting pictures in your email. People love to click on to visuals. Um, never use attachments um, because some, some people may not want to, want to um, even uh, open them because they're worried about um, something affecting their computer. I, that's happened to me before. Um, and I, I just also think it's another step for people to do too much work. Um, always have an option to unsubscribe from your emails and use a professional email marketing service if you, if you can, because then it's, it's extremely ordered. Uh, I, I mean, uh, ordered meaning uh, organized. Um, I've always found sending mail via post a great way to respond, uh, correspond. Um, some, some people, um, may not read what you send via email or snail mail, there's no guarantee. Uh, I think it's crucial to send thank you notes. As I said, thanking people, gratitude continues a conversation. If you're sending out stationery, I also think it's important. If you wanna be creative, that's awesome, but also using stationery that's uniform doesn't distract from the content. Um, and some people use a logo on their uh, emails, um, sorry, my computer, I'm just trying to get this cord, uh, uh, not emails, uh, yeah, on their emails or in on their uh, stationery, but um, be careful if it's too commercial that you might be pigeonholed by that. Um, if you're sending it out uh, that's typed or correspondence um, that's, that's typed uh, make sure it's a font that's consistent with all your documents. I think that's really helpful, um, but it doesn't have to be. Again, these are not set rules at all. These are just suggestions. And if you're writing a thank you note, I think it's wonderful to handwrite it. And if you're doing something in person, I, I really highly suggest never drop off correspondence in person ever, um, because it's sort of like this. It's like, Let's say you don't get up in the morning until like, like me, 11 o'clock is my favorite time to get up and not, uh, not, uh, not um, let's say uh, nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. But if, if there's uh, a, a, I'm sorry, uh, one second, please, one second. Somebody is at my door. One second, I'm sorry. This is my real life webinar here. One second. Okay, sorry about that. So if if there is, um, what I was saying, oh yeah. Uh, if let's say the, the metaphor is, sorry about that. Real life is happening here. Um, the metaphor is, let's say you don't like to get up early in the morning because you work late at night and somebody rings your doorbell at 6 a.m. and says, here, I want you to read correspondence right now. That's what it feels like to some people. And would you open the door at 6 a.m. if you go to bed at 4 a.m. and you're working a night shift? Probably not. Um, but usually when correspondence is uh, uh, dropped off to someone that they don't know you, it can be a little creepy and also it can be stopping their day. So let me just, again, I'm emphasizing gratitude before I go to questions because um, we're right up at the hour mark. And then I really want to have some personal questions from everybody because we didn't have a lot uh, last time. And I really want to hear from people. And then um, I want to also be able to, we're going to have a third session. I think that's right, Patrick, next week. And um, just share a little bit about what we'll talk about next week. Um, so here is a participant of a webinar that uh, I uh, did previously. And he wrote me and he said, I have to tell you a bit of news and it relates directly to what you taught us in the webinar about the power of thank you notes. Um, during our conversation over Skype, so I was Skyping with 
this person um, individually. I mentioned that I plan to write a thank you note to a curator. So the, just to share with everybody, the context of this thank you note was just for someone's uh, work to be considered. Um, you know, to me, a there's no such thing as a rejection. It's just a difference of opinion. If somebody doesn't select your work for some reason, it, it's not necessarily personal. Um, and, and most of the time it isn't. Uh, so anyway, this person says, even though I wasn't selected for the final exhibition, I sent a wasn't selected, but thank you for taking the time to do my work letter. Um, he wrote again, I opened my email yesterday morning and one of the curators wrote me back. To quote her, uh, she said, dear Jeff, thank you for the letter, all the more appreciated because this is the first time an artist has thanked me for being shortlisted for an exhibition after not actually being chosen at the end. Thank you for being so generous of spirit. And she's no ordinary curator fresh out of grad school. This is coming from the director of the National Portrait Gallery in Smithsonian. I asked if she would mind being put on my mailing list, but she politely declined due to already being overwhelmed, which is fine, of course, because the point was to simply get attention, hail manners in the power of th thank you notes. I think she'll always remember that. Um, and it, the point is not for that, for that person to uh, get them to like you. The point is that it doesn't hurt for someone to be able to look at your work or anything in their attention um, if, if, uh, if they didn't have to at all. In most cases, they don't. So um, finally, just for today, I would just say to, um, just because your work hasn't been shown in a gallery, for example, or you're not getting what you want, um, there's always ways to get around things. And um, a way to get around is attract uh, everyone that you're seeking to have a dialogue where your work is gaining traction. So if you sit idle and just wait, it may not happen. And if you put yourself out there on traditional formats, use it as an opportunity to share with others and to bring people to your work to create discourse. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're looking for a job and you're, but there's all different jobs out there, but you're only seeking something that's um, from a point of view of uh, your primary focus. Well, what about all the other talents and skills that you have? Uh, and maybe something that maybe be off the beaten path that is something that you wanna do, but not necessarily uh, that you were trained for. Um, this is very, very important. Uh, as I spoke about in the last session, your assets and your talents within you are something that should not be ignored and denied. Um, because uh, what you may think is a primary source of how you're defined, is somebody else may be seeing something from you. And that we're not defined by just one thing that we do. We are not. We're all, every human being is a complicated individual with many different things and how we grow every day. And I think sometimes the people who go after things in the world only put them, they put themselves in one place where I don't think one individual is one thing, honestly. Um, so that gets back to, what your priorities are. And when I talked about goals before and the many different diverse places that, and, and people that you wanna work with that mirror your, um, your wishes and, and what you want to explore and how you share your time. What is attracted to many is good work events and opportunities for engagement and you can create that all. Um, and being able to share them via social media is also a fantastic way to share and engage with others. So those are roundabout rather than going through the front door. I always say this too, is that if you're waiting to get in the front door, um, by the time that let's say you get out of the line and you start to go, let, let's think about it this way. A good metaphor is if you're in a department store and there's cashiers in either on either end, but most people are at the front and they don't realize they're cashiers in the back. So you're waiting in the front and you're trying to get through that door out, out the front door to pay for what you're 
your um, want to buy today. Well, if you take the chance and travel through the store, and by the time you get to the end, you've also noticed other things that you may want to buy or experience that you pick up along the way. And sure enough, there's no line and you got through the back door. Another metaphor is if you're waiting in the front door, but if you go around the building, you may get to know a lot more about the building and the people inside the building if you look through the windows. And then by the time you get through the back door, you're quietly getting in. Does it really matter how you get into the door? Probably not. So one good way of thinking about it too is that um, persistence, I think, and growing each time that you may not get in that front door um, and thinking about all the other things that talents that you have um, and not caring about what people think in getting the front door or the back door because people don't remember that either, but it doesn't matter anyway what people think in that regard then uh, you know you have a much better odds of getting through there if you really believe that uh, an organization, et cetera, is uh, important for you to connect with. So um, what does anybody have any thoughts or questions um, about these things that I went over today? I just yes. had a question about how to the email list how do you go about like I have a very small email list because I've not really um sort of jumped to you know how now you, it's all about Instagram or adding or but but the emails are what's important right so should one have that on one's website somebody yes yes have your email address and some people actually say to me, they're like, I'm worried about spam. So right. if, if it's about spam, then have one email address that is dedicated for um, uh, the spam part uh, for people to just go to for that one email address that's for your website. Okay. Make yourself available. Yeah. But do you like this, this uh, sign up for the email list kind of box that you get on the it, website? People, people don't take time to fill out those forms, I got to okay. tell you. Okay. So I, I would not fill out those, have that. I, if you want to and you have a special website that's just, that, that requires it, then have that and then have your email address there so there's different ways to get a hold of you. Make it easy for people. I still, don't, I still don't get, like, how do you get their email? Oh, get their email address. Yeah. Lots, lots of research that we talked about last time. Just so, by writing and communicating. Well, no, you don't have to ask them. Oh. If it's public, you can get it, right? I but it. also, if... You know, I, I don't spend time asking for people when, when there's things that are public. Okay. So that has to do with last week when we talked about research. Okay. Right. Got it. I understand. Mac, do you have a question? No, it's just, it's not, I'm shaking my head because it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing in like the <laughs> best way possible it's just like why didn't I think of that kind of vibe um and I and I just and, and I what I keep hearing and kind of this is just some patterns in my life it's just a little bit like what is for you is for you but it's also not magic so like this idea of like it's the sneaking suspicion that like I shouldn't reach out to somebody because I don't really have anything to offer them and they shouldn't really care about me and like I just want to let them know that I really like them and I want them to like me back but it's kind of useless until but there's, but there's like ways to make a connection. So like I can follow them and if they have like a small enough following, they might notice that I followed them. And, you know, and then kind of, I don't know, I, I'm just really, I feel like I'm zooming, with, I'm, I'm vomiting a lot of thoughts, but I just feel like I'm zooming out in a way that feels comprehensive, that it feels like part of the plan. Um, and then, and just going into the nitty gritty things of like, 
uh, be careful with your language and actually make sure to say things. I mean, there's so much of this. It's just, it feels almost like hyper specific in a way that I feel like we never do. Someone's like, write a thank you email. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But because I like, don't know what the right language is, I get super nervous and I don't do it. Um, or I put it off for, for forever. So this, but like going through it like this, just, I don't know, it just feels like we're more accessible. So all of, all of this specific language is, is really great. So I'm walking away feeling great. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. I think these small little things are things everybody can do too. It's, it's like not, not rocket science here. It's more about the way you're thinking of, and also the other thing is not putting people on a pedestal. You can respect what they do, but they're human beings. They go to the bathroom like all of us do. They actually probably have peed in their pants before. I hate to be graphic, but I'm just saying that, you know, we're all human beings. And, um, and, and, and it's also not to say that we have to lead with arrogance. It's just leading again with empathy and compassion. Freddie, do you want to say something? Yes, I think like like you mentioned, small things make a huge difference. And like uh, saying always, thank you, it's it's a great thing to say. And um, recognizing that, um, for example, I today and uh, no, yesterday I wrote um, uh, twelve emails to my students who attended my carving class in the Center for Furniture and Craftsmanship, and I uh, and I wrote uh, like individually to each student because I wanted to be careful as I we spent a week uh, in the class and I good. and I knew and I know each other you know during this week and I I think that makes a big difference and consciously it I, I also recognize that it took me a long time to to write an email because for me yeah, writing emails is always pretty hard um, but I did it, and uh, and I wanted to do that, and I, because I'm pretty um, uh, happy how it turned out the, the, the class, and I had a uh, highly positive um, uh, input from the students, and they were pretty happy uh, what they what they learned during that week, and and uh, and actually I was pretty. And I'm pretty happy that they want me next year to teach again there because I think, you know, being sincere and being, um, uh, you know, like those small details make a huge difference. And uh, I, I think they're, sorry to interrupt. I, first I would just say, Freddie, thank you for sharing that and how wonderful that is. But it just makes sense because uh, most uh, conversations that are, I think, and developments are relationship-based, and especially in the arts. Um, and um, taking those steps to move forward is, however slow or the pace that it may be, it usually that investment it, it, it is paid off. Now, people may say, well, I'm in a hurry to get somewhere and I need to make some money. Uh, well, then you should get a job right away. Everybody has to make money. That's a given. Um, it may not be the right job in the moment. And you, everybody has their own power to select what kind of job that they, they can choose um, in, in where they're going. But I, I, I also think the, the other thing to really think about is that um, how do you build that community and, and in numbers? Um, and if, if you take that time to do that research and investigate and reach out in these slow ways, you never know what's going to come forward. Yeah, exactly. It may not be your timing, but it may, depending on how many people you go after or not after, but connect with is better. Um, it, it, you never know who's going to come forward when. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm not sure if it, that's a coincidence, but... Um, after having those nice comments from the students and also having uh, a new uh, carving class for next year, I, uh, yesterday also I received uh, great news from the uh, uh, Anderson Branch Art Center and they also continue to teach uh, another carving class. Oh good, congratulations! 
much. And I think, um, like you said, uh, in a slow pace, it's it's coming, you know, things, uh, thankfully. And uh, and like I always, I like to, to say when I'm interacting with artists in the community, and uh, uh, Patrick, he knows pretty well that it's like sharing, you know, sincerely what I know and the expertise that I have. It's, it's I think, my students have been appreciated. And, and also, you know, the staff, uh, the other instructors at the school, they also appreciated that. And I think that makes, like you said, the small detail, it's it's pretty important. And I are- Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Sheila, Mary Beth, any comments? Or questions? Or questions? I was just, Sheila. yeah. Go ahead, don't, Sheila. Don't. No, go I, ahead. I just, no, go ahead. I, I was just so comforted to know <laughs> that I have I can have my own list. I don't have to please the whole world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, also, I was comforted to know that other people have this problem of sometimes people don't answer me back. Right. And to just right. stay cool about it. Yeah, or to be careful what I've actually said if I've asked for an answer. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Or Mary Beth, you. Or if, Mary Beth if, if, can you just mute? Oh, thanks. I'm just going to say, Mary Beth, that everybody has their own time. And uh, people respond to things like, oh, I, I'm just going to share with you all. Um, I get a ton of emails every day. I responded to one that someone wrote me a year ago. And it's because it didn't have a deadline and it I could respond a year uh, after. Now I apologize for how long I took, but uh, that's just one example. People are busy. Hopefully you'll get an answer not a year after. <laughs> but anyway, next week, I just wanna share with uh, everyone, um, I'm gonna go over more mechanics and also just even financially, how people can make opportunities to yield success um, and how DIY, what opportunities can be there that may be hidden. But some work I think for everyone to do is to figure out you know, what those assets are that you have that may be hidden that you haven't thought about. Like taking, again, a, a list of now not just uh, goals or venues to be able to show your work or people to work with, but also what the other things that are not so obvious that you love to do um, and who you are that may be good information applies to other, your talents to other people and other, other communities. And I think that's a wrap, Patrick. All right, well, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for the second session of Mechanics for Sustaining a Creative Life with Sharon Loudon. We will be joining or uh, gathering together virtually for the third and I assume final session on the 26th, so next Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, this will be uploaded to Erie Arts and Culture's website to serve as a uh, video resource. Um, so if there are others in your immediate network or community that you think would benefit or value from this conversation, uh, I ask that you please share with them uh, session one and two and invite them to join us for session three. Um, Sharon has been very gracious with her time and knowledge That's and uh, the more folks we can um, bring in on the conversation, the, the better, I think. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I also wanna thank the National Endowments for the Arts for their support of this uh, session and our pro network as a whole. And I look forward to seeing you all on the 26th. Now, one more thing about next week, that's gonna be super packed. So if you can bring your questions too, after you've digested all of this and from the first one, but the, the last one will be a lot. It will be like a lot. I may even go much longer um, if people would like for me to. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And if you wanna shoot me an email, um, I'm super busy this week just because it's my last week at Chautauqua, but I'm super happy to answer any questions. It might take me a few days, but happy. Just tell me who you are so, 
some weird people contact me at times and I won't write, I won't write them back right away, but I always write people back. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for your time. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Patrick, for having me. And thank you for uh, the everybody in Erie. And thank you for the NEA and everybody who sponsors this. So thank you so much. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. I'm looking forward to having a, a partnership with, um, oh, let me just press this, Erie Arts and Culture and um, continuing uh, to, to foster um, at, at relationships and to do as much as I can to help other artists, which I so think is an honor and a privilege. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very much excited about this growing relationship. So I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening for our third session with Sharon Loudon. Uh, for those of us who uh, are returning, as well as those who are new, um, I want to thank you for being with us this evening. My name is Patrick Fisher. I am the Executive Director of Erie Arts and Culture. We are the regional arts agency serving Northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, six counties in total. We are located in the city of Erie and Erie County, but we serve counties uh, Erie, Warren, Crawford, Mercer, Venango, and Lawrence. Uh, we serve four primary roles in our community. We are a capacity builder for the individuals and organizations that compose the creative and cultural sector. We fund and advocate for arts and lifelong learning. We work to preserve and promote diverse cultures. And lastly, we're a placemaker and a placekeeper by working with others to implement uh, people and place people and place based design strategies and development strategies. Uh, the Pro Network is our attempt to provide artists in our region uh, with access to professional development resources and opportunities so that they are more equipped to succeed uh, in whatever way they define success for themselves and scale their careers. Uh, these webinars are funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts through their Artworks uh, grant program. Uh, and again, I want to sh thank Sharon, not only for joining us this evening, but being so generous with her time and uh, participating and leading two previous sessions, again, which you can find through uh, Erie Arts and Culture's blog. Sharon Loudon is an artist, educator, advocate for artists, editor of the Living and Sustaining a Creative Life series of books, and the artistic director of the Chautauqua Visual Arts Program at the Chautauqua Institution. She graduated with a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from Yale University School of Art. Her work has been exhibited in numerous venues, including the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, the Drawing Center, Carnegie Mellon University, Wiseman Art Museum, National Gallery of Art, Birmingham Museum of Art, Weatherspoon Art Museum, and the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, and again, I want to thank Sharon for joining us this evening. I need to make you co-host so that you're able to share your screen this evening. Uh, and Sharon, with that, I'm going to uh, mute myself and hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to now um, share my screen. And let's go to, let's see, whoops, admit. Um, one second. All right share screen and we're going to go to this powerpoint um so uh first of all i i just want to thank everybody again and especially um patrick for for being so kind to um let me just go to this uh for for being so kind to have me and you no know, i i'm just really grateful to have another opportunity to talk with other artists and um, for a third and last session, but hopefully um, not uh, the end of end. I'm hoping in that the last two sessions and um, tonight will be the beginning of conversations. Um, would be happy to um, talk with people or meet with people if they'd like beyond this, um, just as an artist to artist. It takes me a while to get back in touch with people, but I always get back to people uh, no matter because it means a lot to me. Um, community is definitely key. And I think that um, especially for a small community like Erie and also Chautauqua, I, if you see in the background there, that 
is Chautauqua School of Art. Uh, that is Chautauqua, part of Chautauqua Visual Arts, which is a whole umbrella, uh, including Chautauqua School of Art Residency Program, which is a program that's intergenerational. Uh, last year we had, last summer we had ages uh, 22 to 62, a very diverse community of all different people from all different places uh, and all different education levels. We don't have um, anyone who, uh, we don't have any education requirements for it either. So we actually uh, don't care if you went to college, we're happy for you, um, but we don't judge by that. We sincerely judge just by the application as well as um, the work that's being sent to us. Um, so our applications will hopefully be open in the first week of October. We're working on that right now and um, what hopes to be a promising full season next year. We only had five weeks this year. In any case, our neighbor is Erie and uh, Pennsylvania, and I'm so happy that Patrick found me and I'm grateful to him for that. Um, we're working on a partnership, which I hope will have more exchange. And so, like I said, this is not the end I see as beginning. So in any case, I'm gonna talk about just wrapping up what we were talking about before, which in the last two sessions, just as an overview, thinking of what your needs and wants are. What are your goals? Um, what, uh, where do you see your path as far as, um, you know, where are places and venues and practical um, situations that would be able to uh, foster growth um, of your work and your life. And of course we can say, I need a million dollars at least, or I, <laughs> at least I need a permanent home. I need um, many things, a, jo a great job, benefits. And we could say all of that. Um, that's all a given. I would say the key is to try to be able to um, see uh, even beyond that, knowing that, that those are absolute goals. Um, but I have found that artists really succeed if they position themselves in places where they thrive. And so meaning that not just getting any kind of job, but actually being in a place where you really want to be able to be and also fosters that growth within you as an artist. So I don't believe in the term day job. I think that's a ridiculous term because um, when people say they have a day job or they use that term, it means then they're a part-time artist, which I just don't have any um, belief in that. I believe that artists bring themselves to uh, different situations enough to foster that growth, no matter if they're actually making or not. I don't believe that artists actually, the def definition of them is just a maker. We're also a thinker, a critic. We see things, we solve problems, we contribute to communities in different ways. So selecting jobs where we need to position ourselves is part of our empowerment. Um, so when I say community is key based on built relationships, since we do come from a place of abundance and not a deficit. So I did talk in the first session about our assets and what we give as artists. Um, asking yourself, who are the people you want to work with and who do you want to collaborate with? Meaning, who do you want to have dialogue with? And not just, um, it, it's not about changing your work. Collaboration to me is much more than that. It's about who do you want to work with and what are your values? So that's a big, big thing. I mean, how do we find the answers to that question? We look into our work, we match with what our needs and wants are, which we talked about in the first session. And feeling free that we can take a leap of faith like we do in our, um, in our lives, in our studios. Um, re we wanna resist traditional paths that may not be right for you. So meaning that if you and your gut want to be able to or, or rather, if you think into yourself and say, oh, I have to go into this traditional path and that's the only way that I'm gonna sustain a creative life, how do you know that? Perception's really different than um, reality. And so I feel that uh, maybe to resist a path that doesn't work for you 
to be and know that also you can take a leap of faith because you do that in with your work every day i think it's important to intensify your research um, do the work to try to find these places and your own people based on looking into your work and also based on when i talked about research before um, you know what what do you what do you like what are some things that appeal to you what what do they feel in your gut and um and that may sound really hokey and very impermanent and also full of hot air but actually we we go with things we as human beings actually um go where we're where we feel like we're included or comfortable working against that grain can prove itself to be defeating yes we want to be able to enter into places where we're not comfortable however there that initial leading into something trusting your gut and seeing how things things meaning other programs let's say even with a gallery or community um, centers or residency programs like chautauqua school of art um, it match your own vision and if you feel like they're speaking the same language in test in te intensifying your research enough to capture those um contacts so that then you can reach out to them and i think it's always important to pay attention to outsource uh, outside sources by the way these pictures are from uh 2020 coming back from chautauqua so um patrick do you remember me showing this chart last time i just want to do a a re uh, count of this because I wasn't sure if I did or not because I've changed my PowerPoints for this. I don't remember that, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't think I showed this. This is a really good chart. Um, this chart shows, I think, um, something to organize your life ba uh, by. What are the values in each of these rings? that actually are identified with the community that you foster and have an exchange with so like for for me the close and intimate my intimate would be my husband my best friend my aunt kathleen um, my uncle jimmy my cousin danny my uh, well actually my cousin danny would probably be in the close region no he would be intimate very close and then close would be other people like my team with uh that i uh, are mentors of a program at uh chautauqua school of art um austin thomas other people that are dear to me and then going outside acquaintances and then um strangers and why is it important to locate those people because where you place your energy makes a big difference in your values how do you want to place your energy because that's a gift like where do you want to place your energy um and i i i think that what's important to think about is you have choices in your abundance to be able to make these choices as to who do you want to spend time with not who you think you should spend time with but like what are your values enough to um to actually exchange with. Um, now, you may be saying, well, Sharon, family isn't professional, but my, my Aunt Kathleen, who's just amazing, probably my closest relative, really important to me, um, she and I have exchanges all the time and we bounce off ideas. And um, she doesn't know a lot about the art world, but she's really interested in it. And, she's open and if you have people like that who are open who may not know your world entirely and certainly i don't know about her world entirely either but you learn from one another just by somebody being objective everyone should have an editor no matter what it whether it's your your my aunt kathleen or my husband or your your um family member or friends or someone who actually doesn't know much about your world to be able to be objective and take you out of that community to and someone who you really trust so that you can um, gain some insight is always valuable so i think this chart is so important 
And this, I see it as like opening a tree and that core and then the rings that go out. Oops, something's going on here. Okay, so another thing I just want to talk about really quickly is the other thing about um, a, a, a regional, excuse me, regional area um, like Erie and other, other smaller places, um, smaller but impactful places like Erie, um, they contain their own art worlds. Every, I have found that every community that I have visited across the country, whether that be, um, let's say, a, um, a, a big city like Los Angeles or going into Conway, Arkansas, which is very, very important, but smaller place and, and regional place, it's actually rural outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, every place, no matter if it's a large city, small city, it, it's local. In New York City, it's local. People speak the same language. The fact that if I can yell out the window and say how I feel, nobody even flinches. But if I was in Minnesota where I'd live, people would think I'm crazy. So like there's, there's all different kinds of acceptances. That's the same as different art worlds. So um, where are the contexts for your work? Is it the art world that some people think that are uh, like New York City or Los Angeles in these big places, big urban areas? Or is it in a smaller place? Or is it through film festivals? Or are there different kinds of museums other than art museums? Wendy Redstar, who is one of our um, lead faculty, she actually started showing in uh, a non-art non museums, um, uh, I think more regionally, but I have to look at her resume. She's, I can't keep track of her, she's amazing. Um, how about having conversations with education departments other than curatorial and museums? Um, have you thought about showing your work in parks and recreation or public art or in the corporate sector um, with interior designers, consultants? There's all different contexts for people's work and there's just so much more than one art world. Um, and it's really important to think about too that um, who do you wanna partner with? Like people tied to your own values. Who will you forever be tied to? Why do you want to connect to them? Is it only museum people? What if it's a museum person as an artist? What do you have in common with them? I'm gonna now ask everyone if um, you would be so kind as to, and let me just stop sharing for a minute. And we're gonna just go to this for a second. And we're gonna go back to this. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everyone, um, uh, to answer this question. Okay, let's say the National Rifle Association, and I've given this question now a lot in the last year. Let's say because of COVID too, because we're in a different, I think a lot of artists are in a different mentality too. Let's say that the National Rifle Association, which is located all over the country, um, but has their hubs in different places. And they have a factory, a gun making factory that is outside of Grinnell, Iowa that I have visited. Um, let's say they wanted to hire you and give you a million dollars to do a corporate, to do a, um, a, a commission for the corporation, for the organization. Would you do it? There's no or wrong answer. So tell me what you think based on your values. Patrick, would you do it? You know, I'm a, I'm only an arts administrator, not an yeah. artist. I, I don't have to, I don't know. I've never thought of myself in those terms, but I do think that that's a, a really important question to ask yourself, which for me, when I think of my role as an arts administrator, when I talk to others about these similar dilemmas, it's usually what's your non-negotiables, right? right? What are the right. things as you approach opportunities that you are unwilling to budge on and negotiate on? Right. Once you put that million dollars beside it, though, a lot of things might change for, for certain folks, especially given like we don't know what someone's 
uh, live situation is, et cetera. But it does look like Nate's raising his hand. Nate, go ahead and thank you, Patrick. Thanks for chiming in. Nate, you, you had a question or had a response? Yeah, yeah, kind of a response. Um, I, 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 I think Patrick a little bit uh, said what what I was thinking about saying. Um, uh, in the United States, we don't really have like basic human rights, like to, to a home and food and to clothing and freezing weather, for example, we don't have those as basic human rights. Um, so some artists are very desperate. They're very desperate. Um, and it's a life or death situation, whether they have money or not. If we had basic human rights, everybody was guaranteed food, clothing, shelter. If those things were guaranteed and we had basic human rights, it wouldn't be that you wouldn't have the desperation mode. But in desperation mode, people will sacrifice other people for themselves because they're desperate. So, you know, uh, I, I, someone needs to, to have a home, food and clothing. And if a couple of people die from the gun use, you know, well, I'm, I, I, I'm desperate. I, I, I'm, I don't want to die. I'm willing to sacrifice some other people so that I can live. Um, it's kind of with the war mentality too that we have right now with Afghanistan. You know, we're gonna kill these people before they kill us type of thing. Um, so uh, because we don't have basic human rights in the United States, we have desperate situations. People are willing to make sacrifices of their morals in order to survive. Okay, that's one comment. Um, what else? Thank you, Nate. What else? Anybody else wanna dive in on this? Um, I just, it's about, what do you say, a million dollars to do an artwork for them? Yes. Well, yeah, no, I don't think I could. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, I just, there's, there, there's some lines like pro-life people, guns, <laughs> you know, there's a few things, but I would happily do artwork for free for something for homeless to right. lose money for autism or whatever. Yeah, so, we're talking, yeah. we're talking about values, right? Exactly. Like what, however you believe. Okay, Mac, thanks. Thanks, Danielle. It's awesome. Matt? Yeah, no, I, I just want to say that maybe I don't know all the information, right? Like, uh, <laughs> like probably my first instinct is like, no, but is it really unrestricted? Can I really do whatever I want with it? Uh, can I make art sort of against the things and in favor of the things I believe in? I mean, we have examples of that in history where uh, these big social justice waves happen and then these big corporations are like, oh yeah, and then we'll invite someone to make a mural and they'll make a mural that is like anti-capitalist and and then they'll try to stop it but they won't be able to because it's sort of already happening so i i i just feel like there might be some more information before i turn it down i believe we call that research sharon uh a little more research um <laughs> yes uh, but that's cool. but i'm wiggling here i'm wiggling okay uh anybody else abby do you have a thought I mean, I feel like, yeah, I'm kind of on the Mac train. A uh, million dollars is a lot of money and it depends how, what the specifics are, like what I need to provide, wh how much control I have over what I'm doing, what I'm giving. I mean, a million dollars would make it like, so that I would never have to worry about money again, ever. And I could do my art. 100% freely um, on a personal level. And I think it would take a lot, I would have to like really suss it out before I would make my decision. Well, it's interesting. Anybody else have any thoughts before I comment? Yeah, just to, to follow up on what both Abby and Max said, you know, I think they both raise really good points is that sometimes you can do something under the radar that is, yes, you're accepting this, but you're actually kind of thumbing your nose at it uh, in the process of making the work. Um, almost the, the work becomes ironic. Secondly, like, what do you do with that million dollars, right? Is that million dollars self-serving or do you put it out into the world to do greater work afterwards? Um, so I think that 
not only is it a matter of like morals and value, but also like, is it the me or the we that is the, the, you know, the body that's benefiting from, you know, when you do have to compromise. Right. So to first to, to Nate, I just want to share, you know, I understand your view, but you know, artists come from the fact that someone is being offered, it means that they're not coming from a place of desperation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is most artists are not in a point of desperation, honestly. If they were, they would be, uh, and that's all varied as to what that means, desperation. Of course, all of us, you're right, we don't are not granted in this country these basic rights. But the thing is when you're, when, and, and to everybody else, when you are making a deal, and I'm not gonna say with the devil or an angel, but with anyone, who you're working with, you are then associated with that organization, no matter what. So the idea is, what? how are you leading in your values? Now, with Nate and Abby and Mac and Patrick, you can also take this opportunity with your values and say, have a compromise and say, I don't agree with some of your values. Um, I differ with them. So I would like to contribute something where I can have a voice through this work. And you can set up a contract as to, as to what could be surmised as, as a way for both of you to grow. Um, and also taking the opportunity to do something with it. The other thing you could do is, for example, oh, somebody just dropped out. For example, um, Danielle, you could take it and then give the, all the money to ACLU or something, you know, where it was public, where you would put the money somewhere. Um, the other option you could do, there's many options, but the other thing I, I would say is in thinking about your values is how you want to project that commission. Because if it's with a a large organization, which is not unheard of. I'm sure that they have commissioned people before. I can't imagine that they can't, but they haven't because many major organizations have. It's this, this exercise in talking about it is to sink into your values and say, what would I do with this? How can I structure this? And then Abby and Mac, no matter if you're doing the research or not, it gets down to your values period. So, you know, to me, every artist has the opportunity to negotiate. And because if someone's offered that, first of all, even if they weren't offered it, we all have abundance as human beings. And I, Nate, I totally get what you're saying. But to be in a place of desperation, even to say to ourselves, that's a very vulnerable place. So how do you, how do you actually come from a place of power and also know within yourself because you're an artist you have power rather than thinking because i'm an artist i'm and nate you're not saying this but a lot of artists think that we're desperate so uh, i always say too if you're living in new york city and um like i am i'm living i'm in queens now in my house actually i'm not at chautauqua that was taken like uh this summer but i was just there two days ago um or a day and a half ago but um when you are in a place let's say in new york city um i would think it's really really difficult to be able to live here without a without um basic needs because it's so expensive to live in the city um but creativity gets artists really far so i know that artists living in rural areas make it work because they find matching their needs and wants with their community and so in outside of grinnell iowa where this big factory is where i visited um if people are coming from that desperation to actually meet with them and come to that place where you can do this without any infliction on your on your values but everyone has a different point of view and there's like i said no wrong or right but i thought it was a good exercise to be able to think about it in these ways of abundance 
um, even if, Nate, you bring up a, a great subject, even if we don't have these basic needs, you know, we can still, if that person's being offered, they're coming from abundance too. Um, okay, so I'm going to, yes, Nate, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I think that there's a variety of different artists. I think that there's some artists right. that are, you know, independently wealthy and are billionaires, and they're going to have one kind of mindset. And then there right. are people who are artistic that are in poverty. You know, I, I, I wouldn't discount the fact that, that, that there are artistic people in, in poverty. And so they often have to make compromises. And, you know, if they're going to make a million dollars and never be in poverty again, I think they'll make that compromise. Yeah, yeah, I'll make I'll make a deal with the devil and never have to worry about uh, having food and dying of starvation or having a home and and being freezing frozen to death. So I think that is a reality, even though some people might deny it, that there are artists in poverty. I totally agree. But even in that position, what I'm saying is, even if in that position, you know, a, a poor person doesn't make, a, a, a person who's poor doesn't mean they're not smart. So there are many, many smart people who are disadvantaged, right? Who who are, are, are in marginal communities and who are suffering. Um, and if maybe people that aren't suffering as much could lead them to, uh, obviously to situations where, uh, also, I would hate for people to be taken advantage of by a big corporation where that artist who is, who is, or big organization in this case, who is being offered something can actually have right, some rights at the table. So I, I agree with you there, and I make no judgments. The whole point of this is to be able to um, flush out these ideas for yourself. Now, let me ask you something, Nate. For you, what would you do? Um, I, I'm not in a in a desperate situation, so um, I do a lot of art, uh, creative work for free um, because I'm not in a desperate situation, um, and I actually enjoy doing that. I, I'm not very good at negotiating, so I do a lot of volunteer work. Yeah, th that's one of the reasons why I think I chose this is to see the negotiation aspect of it because i do because i'm wealthy enough to not have to really ask for money from people so i use my creativity in like a volunteer way um but i'd like to learn more about it and that's what why i'm here so yeah i, I probably wouldn't do stuff that promotes violence and and and, and murder and, and and suicide which guns do encourage those type of activities um, so I probably wouldn't, but if I was in a desperate situation, I probably would. Cool. Okay. Awesome. As far as negotiation, um, I can talk, I'll talk about that later after I talk about these artists, which are really inspiring, but I appreciate your thoughts and everybody's contribution into these conversations because I think they're important. Um, so I, I really want to show a couple artists. I've shown these artists before one other time. Um, but they really have resonated with me. So Patricia, Princess Rashid Simpson is this amazing person who um, actually is extraordinary. She's a breast cancer survivor. And her work is, is we were in her studio actually a couple of years ago in Jacksonville, and she is just really powerful. She's also a mother. She's um, really a sincere, beautiful person that um, is, is just in this place of um, just really making a living. Oh, she's also a champion fencer. Really? I didn't know that. How do you know her? I lived in Jacksonville. Oh, that's and, right. Uh, I took fencing lessons from Princess. You did? Yeah. I met you on a small world. I forgot you live there. That's so bizarre. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts you want to share about her? Uh, yeah, I mean, Simpson, uh, Princess is, is, a, is a dear friend. And I think that uh, her work really, so she's also a former scientist. So yeah. math and equations and numbers uh, pull heavily with her. So like this work in particular, I think draws on her relationship with mathematics and science. And, and I think she's incredibly thoughtful uh, about her work. Uh, and 
you know, I think her work has, has uh, she tends to work in, you know, three or four different series, uh, one being these abacus series, another being the, um, she, have, she has a few others that she works in, the, the minimal um, uh, abstract works that you showed previously. Um, but I think she's always in, incredibly intentional and, um, yeah, I, I think she's, she's just absolutely fantastic, but I think she draws on her lived experiences very heavily uh, in the work that she makes. She also works in a really great artist studio space that is home to probably close to 100 different artists, and I know she relies heavily on her community as a sounding board for her work as well. There's a strong uh, network present for feedback, and I know she both provides feedback as well as looks uh, to feedback amongst that community. I love that. I mean, what are the odds? I have completely forgotten. I mean, this is just unbelievable. What are the odds that, that, oh my God, amazing. Well, I'm glad you can comment. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to pull up this uh, video of her um, to share with everyone because she is, we interviewed her actually at a, um, at a, uh, a, a, in, a, during a book tour that we did and visit to um, Jacksonville. And I can't seem to pull it up, but I'll try to do that at, at, during the Q&A. Thank you for your comment. Fencing, I have to call her and talk to her about that. That's amazing. Um, another person that I would really look at is Camille Ferdowsi Klein, who's now in Nashville. She used to be in New York City. Uh, she was originally, she's, she's from Iran, uh, and her family came uh, to Nashville, actually. And um, then she went to New York City after her, time, after her time in Nashville College. And uh, then this was at her studio in Brooklyn in, in the Navy Yard. Um, but then when COVID happened, she moved to back to Nashville because she has a small child. And what's so great about Camille is that she's also a curator, she's a writer, she's extremely generous to other artists just by her time, and she also teaches. And um, she is someone to really look at as well. A lot of the artists that I'm showing here too um, have, have a sp specific language that I think is every every artist language is of their own, but in this case specifically, um, and with Princess uh, Princess's work, it, like Patrick said, it's it really really is their work is really about these personal experiences, um, which are are very intimate and um, and have a uh, a, a sense of that things that are actually just revealed that are deeply personal. Um, another artist that I've met on my uh, tours is Amy Meissner, who lives in Anchorage, Alaska. And she really works within embroidery and textiles. And visiting her in, in, uh, in Anchorage was really positive and powerful. Um, she loves, I think, loves to um communicate and um draw upon different stories from uh, different artists in her community and through that experience um her work gets um produced and then when she does have exhibitions like she did at the anchorage art museum um she then included those people um in her in her uh in her exhibition um so you can find more um information on her website but specifically about inheritance project which was really uh drew a lot of people in together i mean i think a big part of artists work in any community is is collaboration with others and also having people have a role in um in an artist's life um, and so you can see some of her work here. This was the pictures I took uh, when I saw her in Anchorage in uh, 2000, uh, God, when was that? 18, I think it was. So 
you know, I I would love uh, to re reiterate the challenge that um, what I mentioned earlier was in making a, a list of goals. But here, I would also make a list of your values, your needs and wants, and what you can give, and what context you want to want for the work and why. Research who you want to connect with and select a few people you wish to re realistically connect with. Um, I would say, uh, you know, at the end of this, it would be great to hear who are some of the people you want to connect with. And it doesn't have to be very big. It could be just very small. Like, I really believe in actually small steps leads to big, big movement. And um, those small steps are essential in how we see, uh, we being artists, um, see, how can I say this, in launching a path to see a bigger picture. Um, the way that I know that, and is not just by learning from many other artists, but even in my own studio practice, where I can see that a small movement or a small even mark or or things that uh, decisions I make can yield to very big progress. So I would love to continue um, to work with everyone. Um, and if you wanted to, I could even next week with anyone who wants to independently talk about Gene Shin's work. And um, there is a thing called the Mighty Network. And so what I wanted to share with everyone is also just to get out of this for a second. Um, so I work for Creative Capital, which um, is this wonderful organization that actually I do have, um, have these workshops regularly for Creative Capital. And the next time I have a big workshop with Creative Capital will be in the spring. And there is a community there called the Mighty Network. And what is what is great about that network is that um, once you're in the Creative Capital um, uh, workshop, and the workshops are um, four sessions, $25 each. I don't make, literally, I don't make any money on these things. And that doesn't matter to me. Like Nate, I also volunteer my time for my community to give to others. And so um, the, the uh, the thing about that community as well as Chautauqua is that, uh, and I think Patrick can talk about this firsthand, is to uh, see that once you have a bridge, and this case is myself, to be able to connect with artists, um, to be able to share their stories, and to be able to hear from other artists, you immediately are then in their community. Um, what I like to do too is, um, like if, 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 if I'm gonna probably, depending on what New York City allows, and right now it's really weird coming back here because everybody is wearing a mask like bananas here. Like you can't go in anywhere without a mask. And now there's a vaccination restriction here where you can't, some places you have to show that you've been vaccinated in order to enter. So um, depending on how things sort of iron out, um, I usually have a great celebration in my studio, which is quite large. And I got the studio during a lottery. And because it's large, I love to share it and have events in my studio that bring people together. So I call that also like an extension of the Mighty Network to invite people to come. So Patrick, I certainly, when I have those opportunities, I'd be really excited to share them with others. And then if people want to be able to look at Jean's work, she's also an amazing um, uh, example and one of our lead faculty members. And you know, it may not pertain to your practice, but if it does, happy to talk with you about her too. I would just share with you that Jean is a tremendous um, public art person, uh, does a lot of public art. Actually, I can just talk about it now. Do I have enough time to do that with the Q&A? 
Okay, well, let me just do that now. Let me just go to her website really quick and we can do that. I just wasn't sure we'd have enough time with Q and A. All right, so let's go and change, share my screen. So Jean is this tremendous artist and I have this up on my screen just to show the kind of work that she does is she actually created, and this is an artist she shows in museums, but also now making, if you will, if you will furniture. So she created, she took this um, uh, dead tree and made it into um, a, a, uh, a, a table to gather people together. So she's a great example of the bridge I'm talking about, where is a bridge of uh, just even metaphorically being inserted in a community to start things. I remember also that, um, this was at Storm King, I remember also that in Grand, in Grand Fork Valley, which is a very small community, I think the same, actually smaller than Erie, um, because Erie's like a, is really like a small city. Um, she, uh, I spoke with an artist, she, another artist who really wanted to gather and have people come together. So I said to them, create a dinner and, uh, and using this method. So um, let me just go to this. Has anybody ever heard of the term a Jeffersonian dinner? Uh, no matter how much you don't like Jefferson for many obvious reasons, one thing that you can do, one thing that he did very well was create Jeffersonian dinners, having one conversation, creating a topic, providing food or you know, bringing people together and having some rules um, and progression of the evening that would basically pull people together that are all like-minded. If you're in the same place, you are probably like-minded just to start. And if you're an artist, you definitely are because essentially you are in a place where you all have something in common. You want to be an Erie, you're an artist, so you're you have that in common, you're all creative. Those are two things that can get you very far. If you care, I'm gonna put this in the chat too. If you care about your community, um, you, to me, you can really um, thrive in a conversation like this. So with the in Grand Fork uh, Valley, what, what happened was is that um, they all got together and realized that they wanted to, the Grand Fork Valley to have once a month, um, first Fridays, um, which a lot of places have, where you can then go bounce around to openings, et cetera. And they had a little art fair there where it attracted a lot of people in Colorado to come to Grand Fork Valley, which increased their tourism, which the arts really do. So that was a really amazing way for people to come together because I think that these small little steps make a difference. And with Jean, with her, with her work, she is a catalyst. So artists, you know, you build a table and people will come, right? And she's the kind of person that um, does that. And she is, she's, uh, we're really grateful to have her at Chautauqua. Um, even though her work is in the Museum of Modern Art and she's gotten all these grants, et cetera, um, she is really a very, very grounded person in the kind of things that she does. So that's what I wanted to share about Jean Shin. I have many, many other examples. Um, about negotiation, back to Nate, I would just say that the mindset for an artist, when you really have those things in place where you know what you need and want and you can bounce ideas off of people and even if you most artists are never even think about it they just go right on a trajectory that they where they think they can be quote successful even though success is different for every person um once they know a little bit towards that that is fuel for that negotiation because clearly if it goes against 
not only your values, but things that you don't find are going to be necessary for you in your life, no matter what's being offered. You have more leverage for that kind of negotiation. Okay, I'd love to some questions and then um, anything that anybody would want to offer in this. I really would love, I love the conversation, that question of um, if you would do the commission. I thought it was very telling. Yes, Nate, thanks for raising your hand. It's I'm slow to looking at images. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for, for noticing it. I've, I've, I've been on some some uh zoom calls where sometimes people don't notice it and then i then i had to change it to a uh the color of the hand to a, a darker color and then somebody said well now you're doing blackface and then oh, okay oh, well, let me take a okay. yeah, yeah yeah i changed it to a darker hand because i sorry. have this light background here you know and then they said well what are you doing blackface okay all right calm down now I um, okay yeah yeah um anyway the yeah i i guess you know I, I, I live a relatively modest life and I'm a photographer and I like to photograph events and do stuff like that. That's what I like to do, people stuff. And I've been doing more and more of that and I've been doing it for, for free. You know, I've just been volunteering, you know, you're having an event come up and I, I text or email the, the group that's having the event said, I'm happy to take some photos and share it with you. and. And then the, the group's taken the photos and posted on their Instagrams and, st and stuff like that. And I'm wondering, you know, should, you know, I'm not in a desperate situation, so I don't feel like in a way I have to ask for money, you see? So if you're in the desperate situation, it's like, I need the money or I'm not going to have food, clothing and shelter. I'm going to die. You know, That's I'm not right. in that. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, in, I'm not in that desperate situation. So I don't ask. But at the same time, as an artist who does stuff, you know, Maybe I should be, you know, uh, maybe I should receive something back. Uh, so anyway, I'm kind of like stuck in the middle here, you know, where um, I, I don't feel comfortable asking for money because I'm not desperate to need it. But at the same time, you know, uh, maybe I should still be uh, compensated. That's why I think I came to this program to see, you know, any tips on like, you know, asking for a fair amount, but not saying I need this or I'm going to die type of situation where it really makes sense. That person needs to get paid because they live off that, you know, um, that's where it makes sense for people get to get paid. If people are already have their basic needs covered in a way it doesn't necessarily make sense for them to have to get paid. Um, well, there's different forms of payment, Nate, as you well know. There's non-monetary and monetary forms, right? So I always love for when people can pay things forward. So which sounds like you're doing, you can in turn also request that of others. So by example, and then also in the process of giving, that giving doesn't end, not just from you, but from others. So I think that's the need and want situation for you too, is to ask yourself, you know, what is it that I'm doing? How can I make this go further beyond myself? Um, what, what is the thing that also not to ignore yourself and your care of yourself that is going to uh, what is the what are the thing or things that are going to keep me going as an individual in the short life that I have? So I think that um, negotiation is also about thinking of the other person. Um, you can be rich in abundance, in abundance in 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 wealth, but that means a lot of things. And so I think oftentimes artists don't feel that they have any wealth at times that I see, and yet they have so much within themselves that are worth much more than the money that would be paid for it. So it's a matter, and I'm not just bumping that up, I'm saying that even like, for example, the classic example is in design thinking, where someone is hired to come in and give their views, an artist give their views on a product, and the kind of advice that they give is far greater than the amount of money that they're paid. So 
you know, it's all varied. And I just think that where it makes the difference is what you, the person, the artist or whomever, to make that decision yourself first and what those needs are, what you need and want. Because nobody else is going to make those decisions for you, right? I can't make that for you. I don't I can't make that for anyone, nor would I ever want anyone to make that those decisions for myself. Does that make sense? Sharon, could I yeah. connect on that a little bit Thank as you. an arts administrator as well? Yeah. So uh, I know Dina Hagag wrote a chapter in one of your books, and that's Dina right. Dina is a fierce advocate for the value of artists, not right. just the value of art, but the value of artists. Right. And, you know, one of the things that if you ever see Dina present, she talks about how a large percentage of Americans value the arts, but a very small percentage value artists. And Nate, I would ask that you reflect on the potential harm you're doing to your fellow artists if you are not if you're not promoting a sense of value in the work of artists so there's one thing to say okay i don't need this funding therefore i don't need to charge a large amount for it but the folks that you work for whether they're organizations individuals corporate citizens etc they probably already come to the table undervaluing not just the arts, but the, the role and value in the work of artists themselves. So I would encourage you, if you don't need the money yourself, as, as Sharon mentioned, how could that be passed on? You know, a donation to, um, you know, a, a scholarship program for the arts, a donation to a nonprofit whose mission you align with, uh, something along, or a donation to the local arts council, right? Something along those lines, because I fear that if you continue to do work without charging for it, they're going to think that anybody that does photography work should not be charging for it. And that can put other artists in uh, disparate situations. So I, I applaud you for saying you don't need to be you know, greedy in the work, but I would also say you might be further perpetuating this idea that artists or art itself uh, has a limited amount of value. I can't agree with you more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, just to go back on what I was saying, if, if, I think in a way, um, if if society was structured and that people all had the basic human rights, um, then it wouldn't be an issue uh, for artists to, quote, get paid. They would already have uh their 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 basic rights and then uh i know i'm getting a little philosophical here but this is the challenge that i'm kind of dealing with as a f philosophical artist um that you know if if, if, if what, what you're concerned about is that, that, that we have people that are uh not getting paid who need that money in order to survive um no, I'm not. I'm not. That's saying not that what we're saying. saying. That as a whole, the arts are already undervalued. As someone that works in the arts, that has to advocate for the value of the arts, that has to raise dollars for the arts, that is responsible for making sure that our community pays fair wages to artists, it is a uphill battle already. And when there are individuals that are willing to do that work for free, they're essentially reinforcing this this already existing narrative that the that, the, that artists don't deserve to be paid, right? We don't, we don't have plumbers going into buildings or electricians going into buildings Correct. doing things from a philosophical standpoint. Correct. And I would just be mindful. And again, I think we need to also provide an opportunity for others to ask questions this evening. So I don't wanna to go too far down a rabbit hole. Okay. But sure. I would say that I, I would be cautious of the harm that you're creating to your fellow artists who are doing this as a living and uh, when they go to a client or someone that uh, should be paying for that work and they go, well, Nate Love, he, he does this work for free. Like, why should I charge you? Why, why should you be charging if Nate does it for free? I'll just great go point. It's a great point. It's totally, and you know, Nate, there's no regulation in many art worlds. And so also the thing that I would just point out is that the the contrast of what you're talking about and and mac i know your hand is is up so i'll i'll go there in just a second but when you're talking about basic needs and you're saying that with artists both together it's 
it's a little, it's a little, it bothers me a lot because honestly, um, whether you're an artist or not, I mean, a lot of artists meet those basic needs. It's a privilege a lot of times to be an artist. Just because we're not receiving funding, this whole country doesn't receive funding for every everything that's not automatic but the value of the arts yes is low at this moment but it wasn't in history in the 1960s when lyndon johnson and before that john kennedy really ramped up the arts it was only until in the late 80s early 90s when the national endowment for the arts was challenged and then from that history and also with the with the changes in this country and, and the country's values and thinking success only yields to money, you know, and I'm speaking very generally, those perspectives have to be changed enough that artists are not seen in that light. Okay, I'll stop there, but uh, you know, I, I, one last st statement, you know, donating my time and volunteering my time, I don't know if that automatically equals I'm devaluing artists. So I'll just put that no, out there. I, 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 you know, and I, and I think that, uh, I, the, the gentleman there, Erie Arts Count Culture was kind of equating me volunteering my time equals undervaluing artists. And I hadn't thought about that. And I appreciate that, but, 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 uh, I, 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 I would still have to discuss that more to be convinced that me donating my time equals devaluing artists, but we should move on as you, as you said. Just one, one more, Sharon, just one more. So Nate, okay. I, I, I deal with this in our own community and what I encourage artists to do is if you're willing to volunteer, you know, with a, a, a nonprofit or somebody else who's, who's again, mission you, uh, you value, what I encourage them to do is if that organization can't pay a fair market value for that work, you still have an invoice that you submit to them and you show what the in kind is that you are providing so that they understand this is the fair market value of it. So even if you are donating it and you're saying this is 100% in kind, you still invoice what that fair market value is. And that's what I'm saying is if they don't understand what that fair market value is, that is when you start to devalue the the uh, the the work of other artists. But I'm not. I don't have a. I don't have a problem with artists donating to organizations that they uh, cherish and support. It's just making sure that those organizations understand what the market value is of the work. But as we mentioned, it's time to I think move over to Mac, who's had her hand up. That's great, but I would love to revisit this conversation because it's fascinating and really important. And Nate, I would never want to deny you from volunteering um, at all. So I think it's amazing. We all do it. Mac, what's your question? Oh man, I just uh, want to say it's really easy to keep your hand up on Zoom. So yeah, that was a fascinating, wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for all of that. Uh, I, I don't mean to pivot, well, I do mean to pivot, I'm pivoting. Um, I have a two part question and one sort of uh, bleeds into the other. They may not seem uh, like they are in kind, but um, I'm, I'm sort of struggling with a little bit of confidence and I'll hit on the second part of the question as to why. But the first one is, Sharon, when we talk about research and who to reach out to, there's that, there's that thing that when your values align and you're like, yeah, yeah, they have the same mission I do, you know, I should reach out to them. It feels right. It doesn't feel crazy. It doesn't feel like my email would come out of nowhere. What is that maybe thing I can say to myself to really give myself that extra push to take myself myself in that bigger, or that next direction? Because I'm suffering from a little bit of confidence issues in terms of sending that email. Um, and I tend to fall back on my heels and say, nah, they don't want to hear from me or something like that. Um, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll wrap that into the second part of this or second question uh, is, um, how do you handle it? Two parts. How do you handle rejection with grace? And what are some ways that we can use rejection in order to create relationships? Um, and then I'll mute myself and uh, take it all in. Okay, to the second part about rejection, there's no such thing as rejection. It's a difference of opinion. So rejection is when your partner yells at you or when you, like in my family, when um, you have a lot of hurt, when somebody has um, kicked you by the side or someone uh, is mean to you. Um, in the professional world, how can it be rejection when somebody 
you don't know is saying no to you? I would ask yourself that question. So you also have control over your emotions because you're an adult. And so you can also, I mean, artists shouldn't be coddled in my view. We're all adults. We have to take care of each other. And in a community, I would just say, you can talk about your disappointment, but it's what you do with that. So whatever time I have a disappointment, I work harder in my studio. I also send more applications out because I can do something with that energy until I can work, process that. But if I prevented myself from, from doing things based on every single time I got a quote rejection or difference of opinion, I would not be in this position talking to you today whatsoever, nor at Chautauqua, nor probably living, to be honest, because uh, I have applied for gazillion things and I, I can't, I mean, I have, I have over 50 or 60 boxes of letters, what I, papers. What I mean by that is I've saved my correspondence and I'm 57 since I left college. And so that's a good maybe 30 years. And so 30 years of correspondence. And in that correspondence, I would say majority of that are things that I did, things I didn't get. But it, to me, it's not the things you get. It's the relationships you build. So that's where most artists find longevity. And actually, that's where most humans find longevity and in the experiences that we make. Because if you're investing so much into something that you want, you should ask yourself, why do I want this? Does the universe, does the universe have a different plan for me? If it does, maybe I need to be able to pivot to that, that plan and to think about things differently and more realistically. Secondly, about a confidence issue. Sure, it can be scary, but are you giving too much power to the other person? What do you have to lose? Just so long as you are addressing people in a way that you're sensitive to them on the other side. I always say to people, the best way to, to um, reach out in a cold call, meaning cold call, meaning not picking up the phone, but actually writing to someone who you've never met before, is to give a reason why you're writing, but also to comment on them, to mention, you know, it's evidence of your research, why you're contacting them, what do they do for you, and also baby steps. I would never write to someone and ask for, quote, representation in a gallery, because that's sort of like being on a dating, um, what is that called, a dating service, and asking someone to sleep with them and marry them right away. And it's like, why not take the baby steps to get there just like you do in any other relationship? So you have to manage that confidence, right? But I would, I would measure it by how much you're putting so much power into the other person, because that person probably goes to the bathroom the same way you do. Mac, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just grateful that this is being recorded so I can make it my ringtone in the morning. Ah! Thank you so much. <laughs> I just, which, that's which, what I needed to hear today. That's why I asked it. Yeah, I mean, many artists, because the arts are devalued a lot in this country, think of themselves as desperate. But actually, if you don't think of yourself as a desperate person, then maybe you're in a better position. Because I don't, like I said, I mean, yes, what Nate says is in positions of dire need, but that's a separate, that's separate. If you're, if also, if you have time to make your work, you're not in a desperate situation. Yes, Danielle. Um, I just wanted to share that I, lately I've been listening to interviews with Fran Leibovitz and um, and what I find fascinating is how she talks about how culture is different now than then, how uh, 
and I guess values are different too, how she would drive a taxi was the way she made money. And the moment she made enough for her monthly thing, she needed, she knew she needed $120 to survive different times. We're living in different times, clearly money-wise, what the needs and how much people are being paid. But the moment she made it, she'd stop. And she would do all the things that she wants to do, uh, wanted to do and go to places and, you know, hang out and stay. So I just, I just thought that fascinating how it's so different. You know, she did not, her, her aim was not, it's the value of time too. Her, her, her goal was not to make a lot of money. Her goal was to actually do the things that she wanted to do. And I just think it's very inspiring. So I just thought I'd share it. Oh, I think that's great. I mean, I, I, I th again, your needs and wants, like what you want, you know, I, I think that's a really wonderful point. It's up to everyone. Nate, do you have a question? Thanks for the hand up. And thanks for Danielle for that amazing thought. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Danielle's thing uh, as well. Um, you know, part of my volunteering for the organizations was to build some confidence, you know, uh, with these groups and the people in the group and, and doing taking photography uh, uh, photographs. So, uh, I mean, that the volunteering aspect could possibly help with building confidence. You know, if you're interested in a certain gallery, maybe you could volunteer to intern there for a couple of days or something. And then you could kind of see what's going on from the inside or whatever. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there that uh, kind of what Sharon was saying before. Um, that there's different ways of payment and if you're doing like volunteering type of things you you learn something that is in that process too and it might build up your confidence in learning more information about stuff that you're interested in perfect nate thank you that's awesome okay other thoughts yeah abby go for it hi sharon so i um i'm kind of curious about if now like standing where you are and what and having lived the life that you've lived is there is there like a specific mindset or belief like shift that you made that you know for a belief or a mindset that you found like counterproductive in oh, yeah. your creative life and like totally. kind of, can you talk about that and like what I guess like what was the impetus for the shift or what what the thing was or you know how did you kind of change that trajectory within yourself so that is such a great question and thank you for that abby that's really really generous of you to even ask that question so i i think i mentioned in the first uh i can't remember and i i don't like to look at myself again um on video so i'm sorry patrick if i'm repeating myself and to everyone but when i graduated with a lot of debt in 2000 uh i mean in um when did I, in 1991, I graduated with the equivalent of $216,000 in debt today, and then paid those debts off in 10 years as an artist. And I'm estranged from some members, my parents, members of my family for not accepting me into a life that, that, I mean, I know they love me, it's just not working, but I love them. And it just is what it is, lots of therapy. And then also from, personal things that I happened that have in my life that sort of really beat me up um, in many, many ways, uh, emotionally, and then just, just a lot of trials, essentially. And I'm not saying this for anyone to feel bad for me, because I still, I'm, a, I'm obviously a privileged person as a white person living in New York City, and I, my conscious effort is always to make space for others. Um, and that I feel extremely privileged to even just be living and being an artist today. Um, but what came to me was for many, many years, I used to care what people thought and then fell into oppression, um, being oppressed by people with me as a woman who didn't wear makeup and who's very loud, has a doesn't have a filter that is the filter I think that um, people wanted me to have. Um, and so I just got so sick of it. You know, my body and my mind was exhausted from caring so much that at 38 years old, and I also was afraid of my father 
And so then at 38, it was just like this light bulb went off. And I was like, why do I have to be afraid of him? And why do I give a shit about what, why people are thinking, what people are thinking? Sure, I need to be a better person. But you know, that relationship chart also really helped me because the people in, in those first three rings, I'm gonna pay attention to them and not pay attention to people who I don't know. So like when that sort of came to be for me, that's when I turned it around and I felt really free and my confidence went way up, way up. And then my career went bananas. And so there, there's a reason why those two things worked. Now, also, I got a lot of help from my community, from therapy, which I'm a huge advocate for, still in therapy, love it. It's saved my life in so many ways, but I could never be the artistic director at Chautauqua Visual Arts if I didn't have empathy or compassion or go through what I went through, but also to be able to see and listen, listen to what people need and want. Having been on two tours and meeting 11,000 people all over the country and three other countries, every state except for Louisiana, we were supposed to go there and it didn't work out at the end of the tour. And by the way, just my condolences for everyone out there who's enduring uh, Hurricane Ida at the moment. It's very tragic. And I wish everyone there um, uh, good health and stability. And also um, I'm hoping that they're okay emotionally and physically. Um, but nonetheless, um, listening to tons of artists, and you can see that data that we collected, it's on livesustain.org. And we share that data with everyone to show what other artists need and want. And I'm gonna go back on tour for my next book as soon as I get this book finished. And um, that kind of listening really helped me because then it also made me think I'm not the only one. And it also made me understand what my privileges were. And it also gave me confidence to be able to do the work I do. Thank you for that. Well, that's a great answer. <laughs> It's my answer. I don't know. It's my life. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts about your own life? I went on too long. Karen, I, I'll have a question for you from one arts administrator to the next. I, I think that a lot of what we suggest and recommend is both based off of you know, a culmination of how things have historically worked, but also how things are presently working and, and uh, what we expect as far as shifts are concerned. What do you see as the future of, you know, building and sustaining a career as an artist? What do you think is, is next? How, how can artists innovate their, their processes so it's not just responding to the present, but actually preparing for the future? By creating their own opportunities, number one, by seeing that the traditional ways in which to show their work are just one part of the ecosystem, by not waiting for things, um, by um, building their own currency and collecting their own audience um, and doing that research. Um, and then also having a different mindset of beyond the, the work that they do. Personally, for me, I'm not defined just by the work I do. So it's like so many artists just think of themselves as the work they do, in which to me, an artist is much bigger than that. And so I think not limiting ourselves so much. So those points I think are the best. Then also practically, artists have to think about what they, where they wanna be and how they can afford it. So um, I'm back in New York City after living in Minneapolis for three years. I lived in New York since 1991 and then I had a house fire in 2013 in Brooklyn. And then we left and we were homeless for 229 days. And during that time I did a book tour because I thought I'm gonna turn lemons into lemonade. And thank God I, I've known my husband for a really long time. We've known each other for 41 years. And it was either gonna break us or we get deeper in and we got way deeper in and made things happen and talked to a lot of people from that and then moved to Minneapolis, which is the number one funder in the country for the arts. 
for three years. It was much cheaper than New York. They have a lot of grants there. But what ended up happening for me was I emotionally was so distraught because I missed the people I grew up with in New York. So then you have to figure out, like at least I had to figure out what my values were and how I want to spend my money. Do I want to spend it in a place that has the people, the community around me that understands me and accepts me for who I am? And not to say people in Minneapolis don't, but I have basically been living in New York for so long that I formed that community. You know, we all formed together and grew up together that it just felt more natural. So I moved back to New York with the fact now I also paid my dues here enough that I could know where to rent places and to how to live here without killing me. So I think that the point is practically figure out where you want to live emotionally and physically and how you can afford that. Because most artists that I know who are self-sustaining have very low expenses. And that is key. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Being gracious uh, to to Sharon for for all of her time this evening, and uh, thankful for all of you for joining us. Um, we probably should start to wrap this up, Nate. I did see your hand again. If you want to go ahead and ask your question, go for it, Nate. I love it. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, it's a great discussion. And uh, Sharon, I appreciate, you know, your honesty uh, in presenting this because, um, you. you know, and talking about the homelessness and stuff like that, you know, that can be a tender topic for people that have gone through it. And uh, I appreciate your honesty. Um, I was just going to say kind of one last point, you know, people kind of go into the arts like myself, um, because they like to create things and it's not really, I, I'm not really money motivated for it. It's like, if you're money motivated, you go into finance or economics where that's the game, you know, uh, people that go into arts like me, we just want to express ourselves. We want to be creative. And so that's always been kind of a challenge. You know, if you're really into it for the money, you're in the wrong business in a way, you know, uh, there's, you know, go, go, go into finance, you know, that that's the business to make money. So that's kind of been so, kind of my conflict in a way is that, I went into it because I like the expression, I like being around creative people, I like that whole atmosphere. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't really make a lot of money in it. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there with the time, but I just thought I'd present that, that, that side of it, that if it's all about money, we're in the wrong field. I totally agree. Well said. And I'll just tell you too, in New York City, when I was graduated from graduate school with all that debt, I remember eating macaroni and cheese every day and having $5 to my name and walking from 86th Street to 21st Street in a temp job back and forth because I couldn't afford the subway. And so, and no one has helped me in my life as much as myself and my husband together and my community that we formed. And there's no way I would have it any other way because for me, we have such a short life, right? And I feel like I say, said privileged, but also honored. and feel gratitude tremendously for being able to to actually just even make work and to express myself creatively so i would say most artists um are happy when they're doing their work and there's great there's a couple great studies from the snap their snap studies so i'm just going to put that in the chat that you can see and look it up it's s n a a p studies from 2000, I think 17, and then 2020. And I would just look at those studies and check out the, the, the overwhelming responses of artists to say, would you do this differently? And of course, money may, is a huge factor. But to me, uh, I'm not doing this for money, no way. And I think you're exactly right. And um, there's something about having the privilege and honor to be able to speak freely, because at the end of the day, people in the arts, it's all about um, freedom of expression, freedom of expression in different ways and having the courage to be able to share a, a freedom of expression. I mean, our expression in, in, in intangible ways that maybe people may not understand it, but they'll feel it. And so 
I or not, you know, I, I, I think so, everybody has their own audience. Um, it's just a matter of connecting to those audiences. I think that professionalism um, in the arts is a dangerous place. I do think, though, that there are aspects to professionalism that help artists in making bridges to create community as well as live a sustainable life. So one reason why I did these books, um, the two books that are basically foundations for uh, these tours, um, was to be able to give artists space to be able to express themselves and their lives, and then also to be able to um, share with other the, others their paths. We split all the royalties, which is all the royalties. It's like nothing. The biggest amount the check that we've gotten is $88 a person. I can, I'm myself a contributor. But to be equitable and then everyone get their own copyright, two things I negotiated in a contract, which is just was asking, that really didn't have anything to do with um, making money other than the royalties do, but splitting that and creating a way in which to make things more equitable in the literary world to say anthologies can be split. And so to me, these little things in making paths for others and thinking outside the box, which is cliche, but there's a lot of truth in cliches, are things that artists can do and are doing and will be doing every day. So that's the value, I think, rather than just the work that's being made from that artist. So that's what I think people are missing and why that the arts not being in education right now is a travesty because of that way of thinking clearly leads to entrepreneurship. It leads to problem solving. It leads to so many things that contribute to the well-being of others. And so if people can't embrace that and people like yourself, Nate, can push that further because you have the resources to do that. Everyone has resources in some form, but people who are out there in the world have more resources than others that make things move faster per se, can initiate these broader things that are policy driven. And certainly with artists working with organizations, just as myself and Patrick are doing as arts administrators, once we're in there, once you in there, you can through education and these perspectives create opportunities for artists to thrive, to change that persona and that perspective from the public. So I think that that is where we can be headed. And I do think that um, there's a lot of promise and action. And I just think that artists have to also get garner this responsibility and and actually make their lives much more emphatically confident for themselves as a place of abundance to start from. So I will just say, Patrick, to one thing before we go, there's a conference that's really important, and I'm hoping that you'll go to it for the National Association of Arts Administrators that's happening at the end of September. And I'm really looking forward to that. And why I'm looking forward to it, it's because the arts administrators all over the country have opportunities to change this course. And so it's not just the arts administrators, it's actually heads of corporations, heads of education um, facilities, roles in education. Certainly academia, is, in my view, has tremendous amount of faults um, that, that they have so many resources. Yes, it's hard to change those trajectories, but we got to start somewhere in small ways. Sorry, I went on there on a tangent. No, I appreciate that, Sharon. I, I could listen to you talk endlessly. I, I, <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate these conversations and look forward to uh, continued future conversations, whether it be in partnership with Erie Arts and Culture or tuning in and sharing uh, what you're doing with Creative Capital. And, and I would encourage everybody on this call, if you're not connected to Creative Capital, really take a look at them and the programs that they administer uh, and, the, and the learning opportunities they have, all of which are free, uh, really, really fantastic organization doing great work. 
then also take a look at the Chautauqua Institution and specifically what Sharon is doing through uh, their visual arts program. I had the pleasure recently of, of meeting their most recent cohort of artists in residence and it's such a fantastic program. I mean, to bring 40 artists from all around the, I typ typically I think the world, this time I think it was predominantly North America together for a, what, eight or nine week time period to co-create and, and engage with one another and learn together. I mean, it's a really, really remarkable program that I think is a shining star for residency program. So uh, Sharon, thank you for again, being so generous with your time. Thank you all for joining us. If you know others that you think would benefit from these conversations, we will be posting this session along with the other two in our blog. And I would encourage you to share them with fellow artists in your community. Um, and and as, a, as a final thought, again, thanking the National Endowments for the Arts for their support, uh, as well as my team. I, I can't say enough how much work goes into uh, arts administration when you're a small group, uh, but, but thanking uh, Devana and Laurel and Jade and Kelly uh, as, as our team is comprised uh, for all their great work. So thank you all, and I look forward to uh, co-creating with you in the future. You Danielle, the, you need something. The, the the link of the blog in the chat. So oh, yeah. Let me uh, let me repaste it. So here's the first two, and we will be posting the third in a recap as well. Um, now, um, Patrick, I will also be in touch with you about giving you recommendations, and I'm going to get on your calendar really soon, and we'll continue this conversation. And thank you all so much. Thanks everyone for your contributions in the conversation, Danielle, Mac, Nate, Abby, and Cornelia, and especially Patrick and your team. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.